Yay, science. Welcome, everybody. I don't know about you guys, but that was the longest 30 seconds of my life. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a great, great opportunity for us to hang out with uh, one of the coolest scientists that I personally know and one of the coolest actors that I also know, and I'm really looking forward to presenting this podcast to you guys. We're going to have a ton of fun. First off, I'd like to introduce our guest of honor, Mr. David Hewlett. Welcome, sir. How are you doing? It's not me. Tom's the guest of honor. I'm, I'm here all the time. You can't get rid of me. <laughs> well, actually, both of you guys are uh, regulars on the podcast, and uh, we're, we've got some plans for Professor Target, who is back as well. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. And David, I may study the stars, but you are a star. So definitely, <laughs> you, you are the focus here. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great. So if, for those of you who don't know, uh, we met Professor Target at the Star Trek convention. Uh, I think it was, was it last year or the year before that, maybe well, two years yeah. ago? And I'm actually back there as a speaker this that's, year. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you just told us that. And um, we Did you get him for got, free then? We, I, they haven't told me, but I better. Like <laughs> God, I know, that's like... That's the reason why you do them, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't have to pay to see myself. Like I see, I see myself all the time, and I just have not. I ain't paying for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to know Professor Target, and we had a great time chatting with him at the convention, and we've kept kept in touch, which uh, is great. I love hanging out with him. He's really cool, and he makes science so easy to understand. It was funny when we first had him on. Uh, through the show, I did a little bit of research about who Professor Target was and like what his expertise was. And I found out that uh, students have kind of like a rotten tomatoes for teachers. And really? uh, yeah, they do. And he is actually very highly rated from his students for being somebody who can teach astro astrophysics like and make it easy to understand and have a great class. So I was like, that's that's a pretty cool thing that students do to let their teachers know like hey you're doing a good job <laughs> that's like the ultimate compliment really I mean, yeah right better than that yeah the, the the site is called rate my professor and of course we're not supposed to look at it but we all do and i guarantee you if any student posts on that website my mother is the first person to read it and like <laughs> anyone that's like oh what did you do to this person like you have to go <laughs> uh, but anyway you, but you can't respond or anything it's i just can't like, respond no, no, no. right right yeah you can't just, solicit I, solicit review. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Give me a five star review. It's like a little banner going across his video. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. he's great. Click here to give me yeah. a five star review. He's rate and comment, thumbs up, <laughs> yeah, yeah. ring the bell, like and subscribe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but when we when we started hanging out with David Hewlett, you came on our show a couple times, and I think uh, Professor Target got wind of that, and he was like texting me, "Hey man, uh, we need to make something happen." So we're here today to make something happen. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited about this. We have a ton of like really cool science discussions to talk about uh, that have kind of come up recently in the news. And uh, I'm glad to have Professor Target here to kind of explain the ins, ins and outs of all that technology because I know David Hewlett is the lord of the tech bandits. Uh, so that would be right <laughs> up your alley as well. Uh, so we're looking forward to it. Thank you, everybody. Self-declared. Self yeah. Lord of, the tech <laughs> lord of the tech bandits. They would, please don't rate me. Uh, no, <laughs> yeah. I, my tech bandits would not rate me well, I'm sure. But uh, real quick for people in the chat, uh, how this is going to work. If you guys do any kind of super chats or anything like that, we're going to save them and we're going to read them uh, at the end of the live stream. So that way we can have a, a nice smooth conversation for everybody to enjoy. But please, if you would like to support the channel, uh, drop a super chat in there and we will get to it as soon as we uh, have this conversation wrapped up. All right, Professor Target, the biggest thing in the news today uh, about what, that, what having to do with science and space and stuff is this m super massive black hole in the middle of the galaxy. We've got a weird fuzzy image of it, uh, and everybody's freaking out. And I would like to know why, because when I look at that, as my numbskull brain looks at it, I see, I see a fuzzy, like, orange hue around a black hole. What does that mean for the everyday person as far as the, the knowledge that we're getting out of that? Gotcha. I'll let you know on a secret. Uh, all science begins with fuzzy blobs in astronomy because you're always <laughs> looking at the most distant, hardest to see thing you can possibly imagine. But what's amazing about this image is not just taking this, this image of the, the stuff around the black hole. That's spectacular in its own right. Mm -hmm. What to me is truly magical about it is the technology that allows us to do it. And it's all about the resolution of the image. Okay. So to give you a sense of how high resolution this image is, it would be like taking a picture of a basketball on the surface of the moon, right? It's mm -hmm this incredibly wow. fine level of detail. And the way we do it is almost with technological magic. And that's what I wanted to talk about here. So when it comes to resolution of images, size, I'm afraid in astronomy, size matters. The size of your mirror mm -hmm. determines the resolution of the image. So the bigger the mirror, the better, better the resolution. So I would rather have one 10 meter telescope than 101 meter telescopes, because I can get better resolution with my 10 meter telescope. Now- Even with James Webb? Even, yeah. Yes, size of mirror. So, so Hubble is like 2.4 meters. 
one of the reasons James Webb is going to be better is because the mirror is roughly six meters. Mm -hmm. So not only do you get more light, you also get a better resolution of image. What, each one of those is six meters? No, no, the the, the, the total cumulative mirror. Oh, okay, size. all right, it's, all right. It's okay. six and now, there's a there's a difference in the in the shape of that as well, right? That's why we're getting different views. So, like, I, I was watching a video on this. Uh, the Hubble telescope, we would get like the the four star cross beams from like the light flares, and now we have six or eight of them, I believe, which has to do with the shape of the mirror, right? That's because Hubble is one continuous mirror piece, and the reason mm -hmm. the Hubble is the size it is is because it's the size of the hangar bay of the space shuttle. That's as big as they could put that telescope in the shuttle. So okay. the only way they could make it bigger was to have James Webb unfold like a flower in space, and you have mirror segments that come together. And the reason the PSF, the point spread function, the stars in the image, as you put it, look funky is because you've got all these different patterns. Anyway, mm. if we wanted to build a telescope that could take a picture of that black hole, like in a classical telescope sense, we'd need a mirror about the size of the Earth. Like we'd have to convert mm. the whole planet into a telescope. And surprisingly, it. Yeah, and, yeah. And surprisingly <laughs> we didn't do that. So how did we get this image? And here's the part that is technological magic. So we used a process called interferometry. And interferometry is kind of like a game of Marco Polo, but with atomic clocks. Mm. So what you can do is you can link together individual small telescopes all over the world, which each of which have their own atomic clock. And then what you do is you take the data from this telescope and the data from this telescope on the opposite sides of the planet, on all around the planet. And because you know exactly when the image was taken, you can do what's called synthesize a viewing surface. So we can technologically and digitally synthesize the effect of a mirror the size of the planet without actually having to build a mirror the size of the planet. Wow. Now, this is not easy. This thing generates like 64 gig of data per second. And we have to do this for a long time. And it's this crazy process. But that to me is wondrous. And the wondrous part of technology is that there's no way you can build a mirror the size of a planet. But digitally, yeah. you can create the effect of one. And mm. that's how we took this amazing picture and got this amazing resolution using technology and ideas, not just sheer building power. Are these but you're saying that they're not just on the planet they're also like satellites as well that we're using i mean this is the next stage can can you imagine how wonderful that would be if we could put yeah. one of these stations say on the moon then you mm -hmm. could synthesize a mirror the size of the moon's orbit around the earth so right mm -hmm. now we're just using our maximum width which is the width of the earth but in future we could put these stations out into space and create mirrors the size of multiple planets what's and stopping us doing like why have we not done that already okay so you've got to have the whole setup out there, which is atomic clocks are expensive, not easy to use, and would have to be shot into space, which is not easy. Mm. And the cost is simply simply overwhelming. But now we know- Does we it cost can... more than millionaires to, to yes. throw millionaires into space? <laughs> oh, this is something I really wanted to talk about. You mentioned on the stream with Mika McKinnon, which I absolutely loved, trying to help people, trying to understand the difference between big numbers. Right? So mm. I'm not talking a lot, but I want to get this on. Here's something I love to explain, the difference between a thousand, a million, and a billion, and a trillion. So mm. how do you get your head around that? Because they all just sound like, you know, if you're a millionaire or a billionaire, you're just a rich person, right? That's, mm. that's a lot. So let, let, let's imagine this situation. I'm an evil scientist, which is at least 50% true, if not more. <laughs> and uh, let's imagine I'm going to charge you a dollar a second to live, okay? Now, the average American only has a few thousand dollars in their account. Now, that's only going to keep you alive for, say, 15 minutes. A millionaire has enough money in their account to keep them alive for two weeks. So that's a pretty big difference but a billionaire has enough money to live for 32 years. Whoa. Huh. That's the difference between a thousand, a million, and a billion. And a trillionaire oh, wow. can live for 32,000 years. So this is one of the ways in my classes I try and help students understand these numbers because if you're gonna live in a modern technological world and we're throwing around numbers like million, trillion, billion, you gotta have a, an infrastructure to mm. understand them to really, to, to, to really work there. Yeah. So I need to earn more is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do more movies, David. Yeah, I gotta do a, a hell of a lot more movies. Yeah. You got to charge more for your yeah. uh, for your well, acting this is, skills. You know, I'm, I'm figuring that now that I'm now that I've done this, I would just I'm going to work nonstop. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be American History X2, yeah. right? With Speaking the, of giant mirrors. <laughs> with, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to polish that thing up? Or are you going to get some wax I should, in there? I should do the wax thing and then get one of those mustaches. Yes. Like, yeah, yes. Yeah. Here, I'll cut mine off. You can borrow it. I'll give it yeah, to you. If, you can, if I can get yours, that'd be great. <laughs> a donation to the tech bandits. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. That's amazing, though, that because the, the numbers thing really, especially when you start getting the scientific notation, I find it's just so easy for those numbers to become very... Mm -hmm. so, little trite little numbers whatever it's yeah. very easy to but but actually you know having that in your head 
just makes me hate trillionaires even more. <laughs> Do we have any trillionaires? Are there trillionaires yet? Yeah, no, we're, it's it's we're about halfway. Well, I'd say we are. Someone is about halfway there. But, yeah. uh, but but still, it's just to give you that context of that even you know, like to, to a trillionaire, a billion dollars is that insignificant. Mm. Thirty-two years compared to your thirty-two thousand years. So yeah. I'd like to get um, your guys' opinion. I'll start with David on the use of these self-made billionaires funding these projects that have to do with space travel and, and, and pushing the envelope on, on the new scientific advancements having to do mm -hmm. with that. Are you guys, do you guys feel good about having guys like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk funding that like on a private company scale, or would you rather have it be some kind of a public uh, relations where like everybody's kind of involved and it's using public money? Uh, David, go ahead. What do you think about that? I'm, well, I'm sort of torn on that because I, I feel like anything that's going to forward the you know our advances in science and astrophysics and exploration stuff i i you know I, I want that at the same time i feel like when the richest people among us their first instinct is just to get off the planet i feel like <laughs> you know i we're talking about setting up biospheres on other planets when we've just destroyed this perfect one that we've got and mm -hmm. i and i feel like if we can't solve those problems we're just going to take those problems somewhere else um and especially the time when we're so sort of fractious as a planet anyways I worry about us going to the moon and starting to carve that up or Mars and starting to carve that up. So, mm -hmm. and the idea that just, I, it just feels so not insensitive. It just feels so sort of out of touch to have these millionaires floating around in capsules when there's just, you just think about how much money, how much fuel, all these different issues that are going on that all this money that could be spent on other things. I'm a big fan of robots in space. I'm not mm -hmm. a big fan of putting meat bags up there. Like, I feel like we're not designed to be floating around like, you know, bags of chemicals. Like, I, mm -hmm. I feel like let's get the let's get our robots out there. Let's get some AR headsets on and do it that way. I don't I'm not a big fan of people floating around. It just feels like a way it feels like a it feels like a, a bit like some toxic. It, uh, it's like toxic masculinity. It's just like, like, <laughs> oh, we're going to space. Yeah, I'm tough enough. I can do it. You know what I mean? And then, yeah, like, uh, but the, there is a, a human element to it. We're like people who are in that industry people who grew up wanting to become astronauts they're like i don't want a robot to go out there i want it to be me i i, I want to explore and and our human nature of just like that final frontier like Pat, captain picard says and stuff like that it's just i think that's just kind of who we are as as people um professor target how do you feel about these billionaires uh, throwing money at science I have no problem with Jeff Bezos going to space. It's when he comes back that I get annoyed. Like that's how I feel. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> so, no, no. So um, I think when we were doing the Star Trek convention, you asked me like, if I had Bezos money and Elon Musk mm -hmm. money, you know, what would I be doing? And I think I said something like, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd hopefully just be less of a dick about it. So mm. it's it's I'm 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 happy that it's happening. Like I would love this to be a NASA public, you know, for the good of humanity and for the good of science kind of thing. But in the absence of that, I'm glad that it's happening nonetheless. And I'd love to, to echo a point that David made. Like for me, when it comes to, say, colonizing Mars or even just like exploring the solar system, I don't think the human body is well adjusted to do that kind of thing. You know, it's, we're, we're certainly not the best people to be putting in the initial labor. Like I want to, to develop space with robots and 3D printers. Mm -hmm. Like I want to send robots and 3D printers to Mars and the robots gather materials, feed into the 3D printers, which make robots and build things we need them to build and in that cycle develop space like that i don't want to be sending people to space to do to do manual labor because it's not that kind of thing but on the other hand i'm a huge proponent of of space flight involving people i do think our future is amongst the stars i just don't think we're the best first wave to be sending out and i certainly echo david's point about you know our own environments in that mm -hmm. if we are going to explore and live on mars you'd want to make damn sure there's nothing else still there from the time in the past when mars was much more suitable for life. There is sort of like a moral duty here to make mm -hmm. sure that we're not wiping out the remnants of, of what once lived on Mars. Because in the past, Mars once was much hotter, warmer, and wetter than it is today and still mm -hmm. could harbor the remnants of life. Well, and Can even you... just our attitude about space is, is very reminiscent of the early, you know, early explorers with the ocean where it's like, oh, this thing is endless. We can dump whatever the hell we want and it's no big yeah. deal. And we've discovered that's not the case. I'm not going to say we're going to fill the universe, but, you know, at the same time, we've already cluttered our orbit with trash I, yeah I mean, that's have you got... ridiculous to me <laughs> speaking of cluttering our orbit with trash how do you guys feel about william shatner going up into freaking space <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's earned it i mean yeah, yeah. I mean, like i feel like you know he's had enough people camping out at his house <laughs> You know. No, that was just a bad joke. I don't think William Shatner's trash. I just thought it was a funny segue. But uh, it, no, no, it was, I, I'm with you. It was kind of interesting that uh, that we have like you know he's he's not in any way an actual astronaut or anything like that. He's just mm -hmm. he played one uh, in 
a TV show, similar to Hewlett. Like, if they came to you and said, uh, uh, Mr. Hewlett, um, because you played Rodney McKay and started Atlantis, we're going to send you through the first wormhole. How would, you, would you take them up on that? <laughs> well, I, 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 see, that's a tough one because I don't, I don't just play a coward on television, right? I'm also <laughs> just a, a coward in general. So um, I don't know. I feel like one of the things I love about about doing Stargate is that I get access to this kind of thing. Like I can, you know, in the real world, I don't, I'm not going to meet Tom's, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, a Dr. Target stuff. I'm going to, I, I, the fact that I can, that I can go out and meet and do things that other people can't do is always being one of the perks of, well, I, I would say the big perk of this, of this business. You know what I mean? I mean, I find mm -hmm. the business depressing, but, but the, uh, <laughs> you know, and the people in it are all aliens. So it's weird. Um, uh, but, it, but the, what I get out of it is, is fantastic because I get to meet all the people who are interested in this stuff that I am as well. So mm -hmm. what I want to give you is a scientist perspective on McKay as well. Right. And the reason that so many scientists really enjoyed, enjoyed your work, because I'm sorry, I apologize yeah, in advance. If anything, exactly, is come out yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, you, you have to listen while I compliment you now. This is yeah. going to be tough. So like as a kid, I wanted to be Spock, right? Cause so, Spock is kind of like science made, well, not human, but half human. And with McKay, I mean, scientists are a diverse bunch that come from all different backgrounds and think in all different ways. But there are some traits that are kind of common to a lot of us. And it's because you need that kind of psychology where you're going to bang your head against the wall, you know, for like five days trying to do one, you know, I'm going I'm to beat this. I'm going to break the back of it, right? It's this drive that pushes you to do it. And McKay takes those characteristics and cranks them up to maybe about 10.5. I, I won't say 11 because there are scientists that are crazier than McKay, but mm. he really cranks them up. But then what makes the character so great? And the reason I love the character and your performance uh, as I watched him growing up was that it's not just the science moments, because that could be that could be anyone. Like, that's, the, that's the writing, that's all these kind of things. But it's the human moments that show him as a person and show his development as a person. Like So for me, I love the episode like Trinity, where they try and pull vacuum energy out of our own space time. But mm -hmm. it's not the sci-fi part that I love. It's the conversation between McKay and Shepard at the end where he's still got the ego, but he's showing this vulnerability and showing this contrition. And it's that that made the show great, not just, you know, oh, look, space battles and, and things. Those are good too. But that that's why I love McKay. And that's why I think so many scientists enjoyed your performance in that character. Huh. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I it's funny. It's, it's sort of loosely based on a couple of the writers, producers, because they're, they are very, very, very smart, um, not always the best socially. Um, but also I did any any of the work I've ever done in tech as well. I found that there were certain people who were just incredibly, incredibly smart. And in many cases that has forced them into into their own little corners of the universe where they are just where they have no sense of what's going on, you know, from a social standpoint. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful role. I was very, very lucky. Honestly, it was written beautifully. And you have to turn it off. Like I, my, I go home and my wife accuses me of talking to her like I'm giving a lecture to a student. She's like, no, 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 no. Like you leave that there. Like you talk to me well, like a person and not like well, that. that was Jane. So Jane, when I would come back from set, she said, you had you have 15 minutes to lose McKay or you lose me. Because I'll come back and I'm like snapping my fingers and yeah, 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 martini time. Um, and, and you know, chop, chop. And she's like, okay, 15 minutes. And then that's it. Because, yeah, you bring your, you know, you, you can't help it. You bring your work home. Well, God, the, during the pandemic, forget about it. I mean, it's like we're not, you know, we're not working from home. We're living at work. I mean, it's like, you know, that's, it's hard to turn this stuff off. So. Uh, before I ask the next question, I want to remind people in the chat who, who might be just hopping in uh, for the super chats, guys, we're going to be collecting those and reading them after the show. Uh, so if you want to support the channel, drop us a super chat and we will get to it uh, after we're done talking all this science stuff. Uh, and my next question. So we, um, uh, Professor Target, in, in your line of work with your colleagues and stuff, do you kind of all look up to um, like a science fiction character, like you, the way you look up at to uh, to McKay? Uh, do you see people looking up to like Spock and Picard and all these uh, these fictional characters, but who have inspired you guys to uh, to go along this path professionally? I think Stargate actually gives us this answer. There's actually an episode of SG One which says, you know, I don't agree with the statement, but it says you can't be a scientist without worshiping at the altar of Roddenberry, and it's mm -hmm. it's, it's not totally true, but there is a common trend that you do see sci-fi sci-fi you know fans in real science. It's not everyone, and it doesn't have to be, and that's good. You want a diverse perspective of opinions. But there, there, there is a connection to sci-fi, but there's also a connection to other scientists. Like, for me, looking up to Richard Feynman, I mean, that oh, guy is an oh, app. Oh, yeah. I watch his lectures. You know, when I feel down about, you know, oh, my God, I've got to go to work, and i got to teach, and i got to do this, you put on a Feynman lecture, and you can't help but be, like, thrilled that, you're, that I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, that mm -hmm. is the meaning for me like that. So there definitely is a trend. 
to idolize fictional scientists, but I, it's just wonderful to see the inspiration and the work of these past scientists echoing into the future. Uh, John's been, John Billingley was the actor from Star Trek Enterprise who said that line about mm. that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to have this outlet and to be able to, and to, be able to, 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 to talk and think about it. Plus science fiction is so useful to me because it gives me ways to communicate ideas to students. So mm. talking about general relativity is difficult, but everyone saw Interstellar and mm -hmm. everyone encountered the idea that time passes at a different rate on the planet because it's closer to the black holes and for the spaceship because it's in orbit. And that gives me a hook, right? That's mm -hmm. one of the real powers of sci-fi is that it takes these concepts that are so hard to explain and gives you a way to do it. And that's why it can be so beneficial. But then that's it all great. comes down to love and it falls apart. So when it turns out the universe is made of love, I'm like, no, no, no. Like, yeah. <laughs> what? I was like, what? Come on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was, Just uh, that, blow that something was up again. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's funny. There's a, I, I was, um, I, I did a, uh, I had a chat with a very smart guy who runs a, a company that does brain computer uh, interfaces. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, in my, in my little preamble, I said, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm a pretend scientist, you know, I'm not, you know, so explain to me like an idiot. And he said, well, actually, he said, he said, well, science fiction is actually the first stage of engineering. It's the dreaming phase. And I thought that was such a great line because mm -hmm. it's so true. Like before you get, you have to be inspired to get into any of this stuff. And if that, for many people, it is, it, it is Roddenberry because there's just so much of his stuff. It's so much a part of our culture. It's a great gateway into into that world um but i love the fact that there's you know when you read these science fiction books you're right yes or or watch the shows again the characters will hook you and and drag you in and stuff but this that that wonderful sense of 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 science i find is the is the is the stuff that gets me i just just oh just gets you dreaming uh david when you were on set and you're working with uh with the the science people who are behind the writing of, of Stargate mm. and stuff. Did anybody ever try to explain to you exactly how the wormholes worked and like how the traveling between point A and point B worked? Was there like an explanation on set so that the actors could kind of have an idea? Not really. I mean, I, my, you know, my experience was interesting because I came in for a, a guest star on SG one mm -hmm. and made the mistake of saying like, is there a, like a Bible I could read? Cause there's <laughs> no, like on, on shows they'll have like a, yeah, just like a, almost like a glossary of all the, you know, terms and stuff and maybe a little bit of background on characters and stuff because, you know, you find out you're going to do a show two weeks before it's on. You can't watch 100 episodes of it's just not enough time. So uh, they they were like, yeah, sure, we'll send it over. And I get to the, the hotel when I arrive and there's a stack of paper about this about this high and they printed out GateWorld, the hmm. wiki on GateWorld.net. <laughs> and and I'm like, oh, sh I'm like, oh, my God. But again, it's just great. You, know, you get a sense of Naquita. You get a sense of, of ZPMs. You get, uh, you know, there's there's a, there's definitely stuff that honestly has been filled out in a way more by the fans than by the actual production mm -hmm. themselves. Because the production, again, like everything in film and television, it just has to look good or sound good, mm -hmm. right? I mean, God forbid you lean on anything in a on a movie set and you just disappear through a wall. I mean, it's all fake, and you have to keep reminding yourself of that. And it's all about getting stuff done as quickly as possible. We're shooting like an, an hour of television in six days, mm -hmm. so it's just you know. So there was the odd time, like SGU. I had more time. Like Mika was there for that. Uh, I think it was yes yeah, SGU, and also a couple of episodes when it sort of it's specifically heavy stuff. They would have her come in uh, or someone else come in and, and and just run stuff through. But often there's just not a lot of time, mm. you know. So I got a message from Professor Target. He's like, I crunched the numbers. I did the math, he says, on <laughs> how how these things work. And I that that saying alone, I crunched the numbers or I did the math on it. Like for me, because I'm an idiot, like that is so beyond my comprehension. I would I'm love so to jealous. hear. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I would love to hear the inner workings of how you crunch the numbers on this kind of thing. How you take something that is speculation and uh, and turn it into something tangible. Uh, Professor Target, the floor is yours. Take things, it away. If I just turn my camera, you can see my my whiteboard here. We're yes. actually we actually sort of did the did the sketch of the uh, McKay uh, Carter uh, Bridge, intergalactic gate bridge. Mm. And one of the reasons that I could play with that was because anytime the show gives you actual numbers to work with, it's kind of like catnip for me. I can't <laughs> help. Like, it's like an itch I need to scratch. I just have to, oh, they've told me everything enough that I need to know to be able to do some calculations. And mm. I have to see if they got it right. You know, like it's, it's a little bit of that McKay ego, but mm. also just because I can. So what they tell us is that there are 34 gates spaced in the approximately 
three mega light year distance between the Milky Way galaxy and the Pegasus galaxy. Hmm. And so what can you do with that? Well, you can work out what the range of a stargate is. So not just not when it has the, the ZPM and you can travel from galaxy to galaxy, but mm -hmm. a normal stargate, what's its range? So you simply take the distance involved, you count up the number of gaps between the stargates and you divide one by the other, and mm -hmm. you work out that the range of a stargate is approximately 88,000 light years. And the reason that number is so meaningful to me is that our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So whoever did mm -hmm. that calculation, did it correctly. Like, because Made sure to keep it within the Milky Way. Yeah, yeah because you can get yeah. from one, any one yeah. planet to any other planet in the Milky Way. So uh, that's, the, that's the range the gate would have. And that is mm. so satisfying to me to get that number and see that it is correct. You can also work out it takes approximately 3.2 seconds to travel from one Stargate to another. And that means you're traveling at approximately 27,000 light years per second. Hmm. The velocity. So you can do these kind of calculations. And it's not like there's any benefit to me doing that or working these things out. But it's that sort of I think it's coming back to what David said about, about science, that the greatest academic virtue in my mind is curiosity. Mm, it's not like sheer yeah. raw intelligence, it's not all these things. If you're curious about something, everything else comes along for free. Yeah, And it's one of the reasons I absolutely adore tech bandits because I can tell it's your educational philosophy of just getting, you know, it's not about, is, it, is this answer right or wrong? Is it about this? It's about, let's just do things because they're fun and get people to care about them and pick up these things along the way. And that's what I absolutely adore. And that's why when it comes to, to stuff like this. I, I, I couldn't help but do it. Like I couldn't help but prove to myself, does the gate, is the gate bridge consistent mm. with reality? And it is. And that mm. was just brilliant for me. I was, That's, I mean, like I say, the guys, the, the, you know, the, the, the guys that are writing this are, are geniuses. I mean, they really are very, not only are they brilliant writers, they've got, you know, if they don't have the math themselves, they'll figure out where to get it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, I've seen it before with, um, like with cube, this this film that my my friends made way back when and again they brought in a mathematician they were they would sort of set up the structure and then but they were smart enough to sit down with a mathematician and figure out make sure things worked um mm -hmm. and then again the funny thing of course is that as soon as you get into an edit and you have to cut for time or you have to cut for whatever reasons you can you can find yourself missing bits that were crucial to whatever so that's i i think it's got to be frustrating for anyone who truly knows anyone who's got a stake anyone who's a stakeholder in these specific niches i'm sure will find will find uh, inconsistencies but at the same time i feel like uh one of the, one of the great things about the certainly the stargate fans and i think to a large extent the star trek fans as well um is that they're very good at filling out this stuff for us they'll mm -hmm. go through and they want it to work yeah so they'll figure out ways to make it work as well so you know. and following yes. up i mean i think i think something david said that was wrong was that you can't watch 100 episodes of stargate in two weeks i assure you, you can <laughs> if, if, you, uh, if you try well hard and maintain a marriage i mean that, yeah. that's, 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 <laughs> for me it was, it was like my second date with my my then my then girlfriend now wife and she's like do you want to watch like eight hours of stargate today and i'm like you know what? I think that's I what she said. Yeah, that was the most romantic thing that she. Could <laughs> oh my God, have I would have mirrored her on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, love, yeah. Yep, yeah. love at first sight, right there. But, but here's one of the things that was so great about Atlantis from a scientist perspective as well. And that every time they're doing something, even if it's crazy science fiction stuff, they would often have a character ask a question which didn't need to be asked. Like, hey, why can't we do this to fix the problem? Hmm. And then there'd be an explanation. Oh, we can't do that because of this. So, like you know, in the episode of Drift, when, when Atlantis is floating through space, hmm. McKay's like, I figured out where we are. And Taylor asked, "Does that mean we can dial the gate?" And he's like, well, no, because we're moving too quickly. We're not staying put long enough. Now, you didn't need to have that line in there to drive the story forward. Mm. But for people like me, it was just, oh, my God, that's amazing. That, you know, Because that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, mm. Well, that's the yes. nerds, right? That's nerds yeah, that, writing. Is yeah. that they're like, they're like so I don't want to be proven wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, like I said, like Brad, Brad yeah. and Cooper are like the – McKay is like this love child of, 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 uh, <laughs> of, of Brad and, and Robert Cooper because they're – they are – you know, they're very, very smart. They do not suffer fools lightly. Um, you know, uh, they have to deal with actors all the time. God help them. Um, but they, um, yeah, they, 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 they love being right. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. why not? I would and too. That, God, that's, I, you know. that, I feel like that's something that we're missing in modern sci-fi these days is because we're watching these new sci-fi shows that are just coming out and it's, it's more flash than it is substance because mm -hmm. we don't get lines like that. We're like, well, our nerds will be sitting there watching and they're like, well, why don't they just do X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. And they don't bother bringing that up within the episode. And that's why I think a lot of people who love like classic sci-fi, like Stargate and, and next generation and stuff are frustrated with modern sci-fi because they're so preoccupied with like the cool new gadgets that they get to use to make VFX work and how flashy and gorgeous these shows are. And they forget 
those finer details that us nerds like feed off of. And mm-hmm. I, I completely understand where they're coming from when it comes to that frustration. Um, so it's, I think it's important to have nerds on set, like saying, okay, we have to have this character say something like this. Otherwise we're going to get called out on it from fans mm-hmm. of the show. <laughs> mm-hmm. now, it is one, weird though. Go ahead. Sorry, go, 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 go. Here's one where I did the numbers and it turned out they did actually make a mistake that I could do from the calculation. So what do you got? There's an episode of Sug Atlantis where there's an ancient ship where the hyperdrive has failed and it's traveling from Pegasus to the Milky Way, but at sub light speeds. I mean, it's going like 99% the speed of light because the FTL drive is broken, hmm. but it's still going to take a long time to get there. Now, what I absolutely loved was that they included the concept of special relativity, which is that hmm. when you're traveling at these, like, you know, not light speed, but just under light speed uh, velocities, you get these crazy special relativistic effects like time dilation. And Stargate was brilliant for including general relativity time dilation with black holes and special relativity time dilation. Now, here's mm-hmm. what they got wrong. When they encounter the ship that's going this speed, they say, McKay says, oh, and they're, they're slowing down and they're really slamming on the brakes, 27G. Mm-hmm. Right? So 27G means 27 times the gravitational acceleration we experience here on the Earth. Mm-hmm. The thing is, the speed of light is so fast and G is relatively much. small. He says, oh, they, they should decelerate to a, to a reasonable speed in about two hours. It's like, no, 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 if, you, if you're decelerating at 27G, it's 10 days until you slow wow. down to even one quarter the speed of light. And why do I mention a quarter the speed of light? Because that's as fast as you have to go before you'd start to experience these time dilation effects in any significant way. Huh. So if they were going- I probably just got the line wrong. No, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it was probably like, it was probably like the, I got the wrong number or something. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would be a very slow episode if it was just them sitting on the ship going, yeah, eight days, all right, maybe not. Yeah, like yeah. that's like, so I, I, I get why two hours was a good, it was nice that they included some time to say it would take to decelerate. But really, if you're going to drop from near the speed of light to even a reasonably slow speed, two hours isn't going to cut it. Mm. Two hours at 27G is is squat. Yeah, yeah, it seems inconsequential. It's funny. I feel like I know more about this stuff now than I did when we were doing it. I mean, again, there's more time to think about it now. Mm -hmm. When you're just sort of like, don't go too quick, say these lines, you know, go, you know, like it's it's uh, it makes a difference. But it's funny. I feel like there's also a need in a lot of these shows to have that ticking clock. So they're always setting up these ticking clocks. Like, how do we mm-hmm. do the same thing every week, but have a new threat, a new peril that's gonna, you know, that's gonna sort of progress our story without without you know derailing all yeah. the lore that's come before. Yeah. And if you want to take it to a small end, I mean, I have more trouble connecting my external hard drive to my laptop than anyone in Stargate does connecting to alien <laughs> I, technology. Isn't it ridiculous? <laughs> I, it, I, if, 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 I, if I was on Atlantis, I'd be in some distant pier, just unplugging mm. and replugging my USB drive. Like, oh my god, too embarrassed to ask. Yeah, you, like, you, forget it, explaining. Like, forget <laughs> explaining. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, any any of the the giant numbers or anything. Could someone just explain iCloud to me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I, I freaking hate. I hate iCloud. <laughs> I don't understand it at all. It's, it's just up there. It's in the cloud, yeah, David. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not the only one who has to um, first plug in the USB one way and then realize that doesn't fit, flip it over the other way. Not it does still doesn't fit, and then flip it back the original way, and then it goes in. Like you yeah. always have to oh, do yeah. that with like USBs are black magic. They are C, weird. That USB, what is it, USB C or the whatever it's called, yeah. the, new, the new one. Oh my yeah. god, it's so great. Because I still go like, uh, oh yeah, right now. Yeah, it's all good. Just plug it in. Um, so we the chat a little bit ago was going pretty crazy over the uh, ZPMs or ZPMs, depending on what country you're coming from. Uh, and I was because I know uh, Target, you you sent us a message. You said I know how they work, and I'm like, yeah. how how do how do you know how they work? Please explain it. All right, let's let's, let's not oversell it. Like, let's, 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 <laughs> no one knows how. Have have really one, right? So it, but... first, I, I know a ninety percent of the people in the chat know what a ZPM is, but uh, David, can you tell us from from the actor standpoint uh, when you're working on set, what is a, Z, a ZPM? They're they're a very very expensive prop that you can't drop. <laughs> That's basically. That's all that was explained to me was like, don't drop it. They cost like like fifty thousand dollars to make. Oh time. wow! I don't know what it is. It's not as much as that. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is all pre three D printers, right? So mm-hmm. the stuff, the actual props were beautiful, all handcrafted. And of course, I was literally every time I had that thing, I was terrified I was going to mm. drop it. Forget ZPM. I was just worried about like you know, you know, having it taken out of my paycheck. But, but please feel free to explain. Yeah, I think that yeah. actually works in your favor, right? Because having having McKay treat he, as a scientist, he would be treating this thing with reverence, right? Oh, yeah. He wouldn't know well, if he drops yeah. it if it breaks. I think that actually yeah. works. But, okay, so uh, this was also mentioned on the uh, uh, Mika McKinnon stream, and she did a great job of talking about it a little bit. You know, she said this is about uh, energy from nothingness in a way, and that's why these things are kind of mysterious. So the term zero point energy is sort of like an umbrella term for 
all of these strange quantum mechanical cases where you can get energy out of seemingly nowhere. And then specifically, the zero point modules don't just work off of zero point energy is the umbrella term, but it's vacuum energy from subspace time. Mm. And so there's a little bit of a cop out there because if I say it's from space time, we know about space time, but they sort of save themselves by saying it's from subspace time. By putting the sci-fi word subspace in front of it, mm. they sort of bulletproof themselves. I love that episode of Rick and Morty where the car is broken and oh, yeah. he says, oh, is it the quantum <laughs> carburetor? And Rick is like, you can't just take you know like a, a sci-fi word and put it in front of a car word. And then, oh, it's actually the microfirst battery, right? So first of all, they kind of save themselves by using the word subspace. But mm. there's several times, both in, 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 the, in the pilot episode, in Trinity, and uh, uh, McKay and Mrs. Miller, in all these episodes, they say the same thing, which is that ZPMs work by extracting vacuum energy, effectively, from subspace time. Now, mm. what does that mean? So there's two kinds of zero-point energy that they mention in the show. So let's start with number one, which is the zero point energy that Mika was talking about, where you take something already cold, that's as cold as it can be and make it colder. Mm. So she explained that the coldest something can be is zero Kelvin. And the reason that's important is because when it comes to measuring temperature, what temperature really is, is the average kinetic energy of particles, of atoms mm. in an object. Mm. So what I'm sleeping peacefully at night and my wife's frozen foot travels through the sheets to plant itself on my back. She is literally <laughs> stealing the vibrational kinetic energy of the atoms in my body and mm. transferring it to a foot. Now yeah, zero Kelvin, yeah, yeah. So, so if a regular object is like, you no, know, if an atom is zipping around like this, as you make it colder and colder, it gets slower as well. Now zero Kelvin is where it stops altogether. So theoretically, you can't get colder than zero Kelvin. Because mm. all everything is stopped everything moving is this stopped. way. Everything. Everything. Yeah. Now along comes quantum mechanics and says, hold my beer. Because in quantum mechanics, nothing is ever, on the atomic scale especially, nothing is ever truly stationary. Mm. In quantum mechanics, things disappear and reappear at different points. They're mm. not just sitting right here. It's, oh, first of all, I'm over here. Now I'm over here. Now I'm over here. Now I'm over here. Mm. And that's movement. And if you have movement, you haven't come to a complete stop in reality. Mm. So that kind of zero point energy is where you could get quantum mechanical energy out of a particle even if its temperature is zero degrees kelvin so that's one type of zero point energy so, now, so we would need a so in order to get things to truly stop moving you'd have to have like a quantum kelvin in a way yep yep, yep. You'd, need a, you'd, need, you'd need to you'd need to break <laughs> the the uh the uncertainty principle you need to mm. know both where something is and that it's not moving at all so right. you can cool it to zero to zero kelvin but you could go below that if you could extract the quantum component of that. Right, now, let, right. let's talk about the, the vacuum energy, which is the kind that really gets you the power out of the ZPMs. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea that space-time itself has, again, at a quantum level, because the quantum world is, you know, it's, it's still physics. It's just physics at a scale that to us, I mean, we would seem strange to a quantum creature, right? Like, mm -hmm. my God, this thing is always there. It's not. Doing it's it. like the jazz. It's yeah, the yeah, jazz yeah. of science. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are yeah. you telling me there's quantum creatures? <laughs> no, no, no. It's, oh, okay. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, about, I'm about freaked out right now. <laughs> so, so the idea is, if you could zoom down to the universe, you know, if you could, if you could look at space time itself, it wouldn't just be this perfectly flat, you know, gentle sea. There'd be this sort of quantum foam of mm -hmm. things bubbling away at the quantum level. And crazy stuff can start to happen at the quantum level. So one example would be, and this is this is getting into sci-fi because we can't prove this yet, S things like spontaneous pair production, where out of nothingness, you could suddenly produce, say, an electron and a positron, which is actually matter and antimatter, because an electron mm. is matter, and a positron is the antimatter version of the electron. Mm. Now, these things can blink, blink into existence from vacuum energy, annihilate with each other, and return their energy to the vacuum. And that's okay. It sounds weird. There's no reason this should happen. But it's okay because you haven't violated any conservation of energy laws. Like you had nothing, suddenly there was something, but then it's gone again yeah. and you've returned balance to the universe. Huh. Now, what if when those particles come into existence, I could sort of step in and pull them apart from each other and use them to create energy? Now I've cheated. Now the universe didn't care that these particles came into existence and annihilated because the average energy consumption is zero. Mm. But I've cheated. I've stepped in halfway through and stopped the balance from returning to zero. I've made a negative energy density in the universe by doing this. And that's that's certainly something that you wouldn't want to do in our own space time, as we saw in the episode Trinity, and why you would want to contain it to either something like a ZPM 
or as in the uh, McKay and Mrs. Miller episode, divert the result of such an effect into a different universe if such a thing could be done. So in both cases, you're talking about extracting energy from strange quantum phenomenon at a level that just doesn't really have a, an analogy or a consistence with regular science on our macro level. So ZPN, like sorry, that. yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, but it, so if they're, so that it's okay as long as they blink into existence and obliterate each other. You haven't broken it's any not rules. okay to blink into existence, get captured, and, and take then, a longer period yeah. of time. Because like eventually that will happen, right? If, if I reached into your wallet and stole the dollar and then put it back right away, you might think, well, that was weird, but mm. you wouldn't really be that upset. You know, you'd still have the same amount of money that you had before. Mm. Whereas if I reach into your wallet and take a dollar and then don't and then leave you with an anti-dollar, like I've left you with <laughs> negative one dollars and I've got your positive dollar, you'd be a little annoyed because you're like, hey. Not only if you take my money. getting annoyed, but this is, I guess this is the question is who's getting annoyed here? All right, yeah. So this, on the so, quantum level. This is the problem with words, right? So words, you know, they're, they're good for us to communicate, but they kind of get sloppy. Yeah, at yeah. These kind of levels. So, so it's, it's hard for me not to describe it without implying an intent or a, yeah, a driving yeah. force. So I'm, I'm, I often accidentally talk about the universe as if it has a, you know, like the universe is upset that I'm stealing its vacuum energy, right? That, right. that implies there's something to think. But really, it's not upset. It's that physics, the, the, the rules of the universe are upset that I'm trying to break the rules and they might fight back again, not in a sort of grumpy kind of way, just in a, Hey, you did something, you broke the rules. And now the result of that is I'm going to produce this virtual particle over here that you can't contain and destroys five, six of a solar system. Hmm. Like that. So I don't know what, I don't know why you would think, bring that up. No, no, no. Just a, <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this might be a, a dumb question, professor target, no, but I'm like, so, <laughs> so when you're talking about this immediately, I think about the, the saying was like energy cannot be created or destroyed. It, it just kind of exists and it gets transferred. So does that theory of zero point, point module where you're basically kind of getting energy from some quantum realm, does that fly in the face of the energy can't be created or destroyed? Is there a, a, an I think issue it's there? Messier and more complicated. So the idea is I am extracting, it's the concept of we don't know for sure exactly what vacuum energy or dark energy is. Like we have, we have some ideas, but we don't quite know. So it wouldn't be that we'd be violating the principle, it's we'd be tapping into something we didn't know about before and we don't know what the consequences of doing such a thing mm. would be. But, but but here's the wonderful thing about science and that you've got to be comfortable as a scientist with things that you can prove or demonstrate or understand and the things you can't. Mm. So as a scientist, I will never be able to say what caused the Big Bang, right? Or I can't even say, was there anything before the Big Bang? Because time only comes into existence with the mm. Big Bang. So the word before doesn't even apply to before mm. that. And as a scientist, all the tools I have, kind of like this idea that energy can't be created or destroyed, those are just rules of the universe. So those rules, I can't apply them to a time before the universe existed. Mm. So it doesn't bother me that I can't say a single thing and probably never can about say what caused the universe to come into existence. I can just tell you what I do know about the things that we can study and can prove. So does this violate the rule of energy conservation? No, it doesn't violate the rule, but it's but it makes it far messier than it was mm. before. It's I've been reading a bunch of stuff, um, some molecular biology stuff, and they talk about all of this, the idea of like, cre how do they create and how does how to, you know, uh, how does biology create energy and use energy without without, you know, offending the, um, you know, the the law of conservation and the way they this one, this beautiful sort of clock like system that they have for for, you know, as long as as long as the energy comes up like this, it could be it could be accounted for over here and. I just imagine that it's just so complex when we get to the this, the state of the universe that it's stuff that we just don't have the we just don't have the, the computing power for yet. Speaking mm -hmm. about words, I mean, scientists describe the universe as finite but unbound, right? And that <laughs> term that term is mutually exclusive. Finite mm -hmm. means there's a limited amount of something, but unbound means there's no edge mm -hmm. and no center. So we know our we know our limits. And that's the important part as a scientist. It doesn't bother me that I have to say these these contradictory things. What what's important to me is that I can justify. The limited amount of stuff that I do know, mm. and I love the stuff that I love looking at the stuff that I don't know. But it doesn't. You've got to get. You've got to get comfortable with the idea of I don't know. I don't know mm. is not. It's not a problem. In fact, it's a wonderful starting point. Like I don't and know. It drives me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it. I just hate it. I got my wife always laughs about it. She's like, "Oh God, here we go." Because he's just yeah. someone will say something on television or on a podcast or something, and I'm like, "Really?" And then I'm off looking stuff up, and then next thing you know, you know, you're taking a course in something you didn't, you never had any interest in your life just to figure out what the hell they're talking about. But this is great. I mean, that's that's what I'm saying. That's that's why curiosity is the greatest virtue 
of science. You know, and I watch, you know, just say I watch a movie, just say I watch Titanic. You know, the first mm. thing I'm gonna go and do is read like the history of the ship and things like this mm. so I can understand the context of the thing I'm reading. And so your wife may hate it, but I love it, right? Because <laughs> that, that to me is like, oh my God, I have to, I have to look into this. I have to figure it out. It's uh, it's curiosity, man. I just it's it's amazing. It's just yeah, I, yeah just love it. Uh, David, I don't know because you listen to a lot of podcasts and and stuff like that. I don't know. Have you heard of this? Um, it's dark matter or dark energy that's around the universe where they can kind of like they've been looking in these telescopes and they say there's there's a gravitational pull there, but we can't see anything. Mm. And it's not a black hole. I was I think it might have been Neil deGrasse Tyson or somebody like that who was talking about this on a on a uh, documentary. And I just I found that fascinating because yeah. there's so much that we don't know about space. And I'm like I was so excited to meet Professor Target because I'm like this is the guy that I'm going to get the answers from because I yeah. feel that same way when I I learn about something on TV or a podcast or whatever and I go that is weird and it doesn't make any sense to me. I need somebody to explain it to me. So um, Professor Target, ha have you guys studied this? Like what's the uh, What's the scientific community doing with this information about this like dark energy or this black mm. matter? So I teach about these things in my cosmology class. And the reason they're so fun to talk about is because they're a perfect example of what we were just discussing. Like there's the things we do know about it and the things we don't know about it. And that's what science is. Science is moving that needle just a little bit. Mm. So uh, here's the analogy. If you imagine the universe as a pint of Guinness, right? 95% of that pint is dark and the top 5% is white. You can see mm. it. That's like our universe. 5% of the universe is what we call baryonic matter. That just means regular stuff like you, me, this planet, stars, things like that. So the 5%? Stuff that 5%? That's it? Yep, yep. Wow. Just 5%. Now, the other 95% is theorized to be in the category dark. And that subdivides into a sort of breakup of about 20-ish, you know, 22-ish, 21-ish percent dark matter, you know, and 70-something percent dark energy. And we'll talk mm. about them separately because... Uh, so you asked me at the Star Trek convention, what is dark matter? And my initial mm -hmm. answer would be like, that's, that's like an hour of a lecture. But dark matter is kind of like the uh, force. It surrounds us, it penetrates us, and it binds the universe together. So dark matter is like regular matter instead of, but, the, but there's a big difference in that dark matter only interacts with itself and other stuff gravitationally. Hmm. So if I have two protons, they'll try and bump into each other and they can't do it. Dark matter, two, if you had two particles, if it is a particle, could just pass right through each other like that. Mm. So it's, we understand where dark matter is, what it's doing, and how it's doing it, but we have no idea what it actually physically is. Mm. And that's the important part about the science, is that you can demonstrate where it is, what it's doing, and how it's doing it, but you can't. we have yet to prove what it actually is. Now, dark energy is even more in the category of the unknown, because dark energy is really just a placeholder term for something that we've included in our ingredient list of the universe to account for the expansion of the universe. Mm. So dark energy, we don't know where it is, what it's doing or how it's doing. It's just a placeholder term that accounts for the expansion of the universe. So as we go down this pint of Guinness, it gets more and more mysterious like that. Mm. And it's not that, you know, science isn't perfect. You know, science doesn't know everything. Otherwise it would stop. That's kind of like the definition of how it works. <laughs> right. But we can give you this rough ingredient list based upon here is what the ingredient list would need to be to make the universe do what we see it doing. And it I'm always more... reminds me of like, of, you know, back in the, the, in the old days when they would talk about like ether or something, there'd be like this sort of this general catch all. Oh, and that's, uh, that's this magical stuff that uh, does, you know, things that, uh, that will work. I'm sure in the future sometime, it feels almost like a placeholder for yep, yep. what we, for what we know. All of science. I mean, oxygen was once like that. People knew they had to mm. breathe but they didn't know why they had to breathe, right? That was the, that was the frontier of science at some point in our history. Mm. And now this frontier has just shifted further mm. out as we understand more and more things. And I think it's easier to be a scientist today simply because, you know, if you lived a few thousand years ago, almost everything that happened in your life would be a mystery. Mm. You know, why did this person get sick? Why did that lightning bolt go off? Why did that volcano erupt? Why is there mm. an eclipse? Like everything in your universe would be a complete, and that must be terrifying as a sentient creature. Straight Whereas, to God. Straight yeah, yeah, to God every exactly. time. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas today, yeah. I, I can explain almost all of the things I will encounter on a day-to-day -day basis on the Earth without, you know, to, without having to resort <laughs> to the supernatural. Mm. And so it's much easier to be comfortable with that. There are things I don't know because that category is you know, still massive, but so much smaller than it was mm. in the past. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's easier to be a little more objective about it now. Yeah, when, and, and I'm, not, I don't, I'm not using ignorance as like a... Um, 
an offensive term or, or to make fun of somebody, but like the ignorance of not knowing how something works. And there's a comment just a second ago about Thor, the God of thunder, right? People back in the day, they were like, Oh, where's this, this bright light and this loud noise coming from? Oh, it's the God of thunder. Like he is the one who's upset with us for whatever reason. People like, uh, people back in the day who don't understand things and who don't have an explanation for it, they will put that placeholder in it, whether it's God or whatever angels, it's the mythology that we all grew up with. If they don't understand it, they'll put something there to help them make sense of it mm. un until something new comes along that they can actually make, you know, change their opinions. And then they can be like, Oh, it's because of X, Y, and Z. So we're I, not I, good with the unknown. Are we? Yeah, no, we we're to not. Come we, up with something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Even if it's human like tendency. someone slept, something came down and slept with a cow and then they had a baby <laughs> with their brother. And yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. All this weird, the weird God stuff. Yeah. Zeus was a pretty uh, frisky fellow. In the good Lord. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, was, you know, Greek mythology is horny as heck, man. It's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> this is what, like, like in, in my first lecture in my introductory astronomy class, and this is a GE, like general education class. Mm. Like I try and explain to them, you know, like how I want them to think and act, to think as a scientist. And I say, look, just, just do, just do one thing. Like there are, there are all these wonders around you. Like oh, most of you, while I've been giving this lecture, have probably been using your cell phone right now. Now think about how that cell phone is connecting to the internet. You know, think mm -hmm. about how, the internet works. Think about how electricity comes out of holes in walls. Like, you know, these are just take one element of your life, which is wondrous, and just do a little bit of reading about it. Because well, this is what drives me nuts is that, you know, you have kids coming into school and the first couple of grades, they come in and they are just so excited to learn everything. And I feel like the first thing the school system does is just destroy that curiosity. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, learning becomes a bad word. And they don't see that connection between things that they're interested in and things that they need to learn. Yeah. And that for me, like that destroyed my education growing up. Like I just couldn't, I could never see the connection between the stuff that I was, the electronics and the, and, and the sciencey silliness that I was doing after school and the stuff that was happening in school. I never saw that connection. I mean, it was, I was just wasting time. Um, and it, it bothers me now to see so many people just accept stuff the way it is. Um, you know, oh, the Xbox is broken, so we just throw it out and get a new one. It's like, no, you don't. I mean, get a new one, sure, but you know, but take that one apart. And let's see what it, <laughs> see what's got in it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's funny because I did that exact same thing. Um, this is uh, it's not off topic, but it's kind of in line with that. Where like I homeschool my kids, so I try to find anything I can do to educate my kids and to make it interesting. And sure enough, my son broke our Xbox because he jammed the HDMI cord. Uh, into it too hard and like bent the pins right. and he didn't understand why the xbox wasn't working and i'm like okay well let's take it apart and find out so i i got all my tools out i took the whole thing apart and i got a um a magnifying glass and i showed him the hdmi cord and where the pins had been bent so that they don't make that connection anymore and i tried to explain to him that's why it's not working because the connections aren't there to feed it to feed the information to the tv and i tried to fix it I, I don't know much about electronics or how to solder and stuff i replaced the hdmi port and i tried to solder it back on but it still didn't work so i gave it to my uh, i gave it to my brother-in-law who's very very tech savvy and he's the guy who can take anything apart and fix it so he's like oh, i'll take care of it for you when i get a chance but it's it's interesting like learning things is better when you can kind of relate to it and you're like oh that's why this works or why it's important that I know about that. So I think um, education with kids is, is super important to make sure that's that. I love like, YouTube. I, yeah. Because, you know, it's like the collective knowledge of the human race. Uh, yeah. We can choose it to watch people, you know, fall down drunk at birthday parties, or we could actually learn something. You know what I mean? And uh, I, if you can inspire people to take that plunge, it's, it's amazing. You know? mm -hmm. oh, and I, failure I, is an absolutely essential part of that process. Mm -hmm. Like you may not have succeeded in soldering that HDMI cable this time, but you'd be better at it next time. Mm -hmm. And you have you have that concept of you know that there is something that connects the adapter to the wire that does it. And every scientist will tell you. I mean, most of what we do is attempts. Now, you, what we publish is our successes, and it's almost a shame that we don't publish our failures because there's a perverse incentive of you know you need to publish or perish or right. push forward like that. That can be kind of tough. So, like so failures in science are almost, if not more important in many ways than the successes because first of all, you eliminate possibilities that aren't correct, but you also develop your own understanding. And I think it's something that people are so terrified of either admitting failure or being seen to have failed. Mm, but it's looking like an idiot. Yeah, yeah it's an, yeah, I, I'm, I look like an idiot all the time. It's how mm. I became <laughs> what I am. And it's, but it's, it's that process. And I think people are more and more afraid of, of being seen to do that. And I think the system is, you know, the educational system in many ways is 
is trying to postpone that first point of failure further and further out. Mm. I think schools, and this isn't a criticism of educators who work beyond, you know, incredibly hard to, for, for the best interest of their students. So I'm not chewing anyone out. I'm just saying that they're under pressure to get students through classes and graduate and do things like this. But mm, yeah. there is tremendous importance in letting people try things and for those things to fail and then to try again. Like there's, mm. there's nothing, the only thing you can do wrong with failure is is not try again, is not learn from it. That's the yeah, only it's the reaction that, to failure is what yeah. we need to do. I mean, it's, it's that, essential. it's like, it's, I was, I, you know, I would joke with the tech bandits when we were doing it live. I would joke that uh, I was like, ah, oh, damn, we got it right. We didn't learn anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> So it's like you want it to go wrong because that's where you find that's where you that's where you find unique ways and approaches to doing stuff. You know, you, mm -hmm. you're surprised by because you we all have these very specific visions of of you know or 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 blinkers on to suddenly have a kid go. Well, what if you do it like this? Your first response is always like, "What are you an I idiot? Oh, wait a second, that's such a kind of neat." You know what I mean? Like there's just you know there's 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 that there's that. I think from a future proof skill would be. Uh, would I, what I think B would be that, would be that how, how does one deal with failure? Mm -hmm. One of my favorite things I do when I teach a lab class and I have them do just solving simple problems with pencil and paper is right in the middle of the second lab, I set a problem that is uh, a non sequitur. It's a problem mm -hmm. that it's like, you know, how many times could you fit the density of Jupiter into the temperature of Saturn, right? Mm -hmm. you, these are non-compatible things. And then it's absolutely joyous to watch the pages and pages of right. mind-bending attempts they have but those are and of course they're really upset with you when you tell them ha can't be done right but it's but it's that they they learn more from that attempt mm -hmm. you know than than they do from getting something right and just moving on to the next but thing. that's interesting too that's an interesting point though i feel like the edu it's not so much the educators 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 um uh, as it is the system itself which i think is 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 moving kids towards the right answer mm -hmm. and the problem is in the future and as a grown up if that's what you can call me, um, <laughs> you know, it's, there are no right answers. You know what I mean? Like n not knowing that there is a right answer is a whole different approach to a problem than going like, what's the answer this person is looking for. I feel like we're just teaching kids how to uh, work within a system basically. Yeah. And that's, and it's a system that probably won't even exist in many of the jobs that they're, that don't exist yet, you know, for them in the future. So Yep, this is a this is as 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 Kadish is saying. This is a, a Kobayashi Maru scenario. There is value mm. to just you know just it's it's the attempts, it's the failures, and it's the reflection mm -hmm. that make that like. And that's why I love to give questions like that. And of course, they they first of all they hate it, but by the end they often see the value in you know like not every problem you're presented in the world has a solution. Mm. I mean, trust me, I'm I'm married. I know what it's like to try everything and lose <laughs> at occasions, right? But that's, but, that's, but that's part of the process. You it's know, the it's, dog it's, for me. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. my wife is perfect. The dog is, is, a, is a mystery, an enigma, and a <laughs> quantum puzzle of some sort, yeah. So uh, we talked a little bit about um, our solar system and, and how close we are to being able to like access it. And the technology we have is there. It's just we need to have somebody to put the pedal to the metal, basically. Um, Hula, if, if you were presented with an opportunity to like say like oh look we're gonna go to the moon to the moon uh it's a six month project you're gonna go there we're gonna create a biome and uh, and work there and do some studies and stuff like that would you would you be willing to take on that and and be like yeah i want to go it would because it, it feels like it's the next step for us mm -hmm. it's like the moon is right there we've already been there once we can go again and we just need to set up some kind of a base there is that something that you'd be interested in doing as as just a person it's 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 so funny for me because i I would within a, without a second's hesitation, I would do it. But at mm. the same time, it's against everything that I, that I believe in that, if that makes sense. Like, I just don't think that should be a priority for us. But at the same time I go, if I was given like, look, if a millionaire decided they wanted to fling me around in a capsule, I, I mean, you know, I'd be an idiot to say no to it. But at the same time, my belief, my belief system, uh, you know, is, is sort of against, I just don't, I mean, I, I really feel like, we have this perfect biome. We have this mm -hmm. perfect system that was set in place and we, we exist in it. And we, to think that we're going to destroy it and then move <laughs> on to somewhere else just yeah. feels like what we, we stand no chance of making something workable on another planet. If we can't figure out how to stop, how to, if we can't figure out how to feed our populations to stop killing, I mean, I sound like such a hippie here without the hair, um, you know. <laughs> but it it really bothers me that that we we haven't. That I feel like there are problems that need to be solved before we figure out how we're gonna 
you know what the best combination of people to put on a on a planet yeah. is and i would not put an actor up there but you know that's <laughs> just me well that's the thing though is like uh, a lot of these things they need that public support and in order to get public support they usually have to put a name a recognizable name behind it mm. which then turns into funding and money and other things like that so yeah like unfortunately we don't live in a star trek universe where where there's no money anymore and everything is just created in a in a you know laser beam thing in your cabinet mm -hmm. uh <laughs> so it's like we have yeah, to chew we on that science <laughs> yeah, yeah a laser beam thing in your cabinet it's a laser beam thing that makes shit <laughs> <laughs> i am the o'neill of this conversation <laughs> i just it, don't i'm it. like whatever um <laughs> but i just like we don't live in that universe where where things are just easily attainable for us we have to we have to put money behind it we have to put funding behind it and i, I always wonder like what's the logistics of like when is it going to make sense for us to do that? Because I, I work in the mining industry, so like we dig underground to get minerals to use for Tesla cars and stuff like that. And I'm like, at what point in time is it going to be monetarily feasible for us to go to an asteroid and get those same minerals and bring it back to Earth? Like there has to be a, a profit in it, otherwise nobody's ever going to do it. And I was I, I was watching this uh, the science video on like space elevators and these like slingshot type things mm. that are like the concept of how do we make space travel cheap and and able to make it profitable for somebody to actually go out there and do this kind of stuff. Mm. And I was wondering, is there any is there any headway, Professor Target, in like how do we get to space easily without burning you know thousands upon thousands of gallons of of rocket fuel to get there? So a space elevator is hopefully something that we'll definitely need in the future. So the idea is that you have the Earth, and in orbit of the Earth, you would have a large mass, say like a relatively small asteroid or something like that. And you would create a physical tether beneath the surface of the Earth and that asteroid so that you could raise or lower things up and down, as you say, mm -hmm. without having to ride on a barely contained explosion in a tube, which mm -hmm. is our current modality of doing it. So It does seem a little old-fashioned, doesn't it? It does seem a little old-fashioned. Yeah. But the thing is the getting to that stage is still so far away from us because you have to, to actually go out and get something like that and safely bring it back and build this structure is beyond anything we've ever attempted. Mm. Yeah, this is this is engineering on scales that we are, are nowhere near. Uh, and mostly, unlike in Stargate, where things have to happen in a short space of time, this is something you'd need to happen over a very long space of time. Like, you wouldn't get an asteroid, strap a bunch of 302s to it and block the Azuran beam to, to take off the city, right? You would mm -hmm. strap an, a very like a, a solar sail or an ion drive or something to do a little nudging over mm -hmm. a long period of time. Now, it would also be one of the most dangerous things we'd ever done as a species because deliberately bringing a giant asteroid into the orbit of the Earth mm -hmm. could also be the end of us. Yeah. So I'd say we are still- You want that on, thing tied down well. <laughs> yeah, 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 we are still a long, long way from, I'm afraid we're riding the rockets for some time to come. Mm -hmm. When it comes to going to space, I mean, if you'd asked me when I was 20 and immortal, I would have jumped on that rocket straight away. If you ask me today, I'm going to wait at least 10 years until I've paid for my daughter to go through college. But after <laughs> that, then, then, I'll go, then I'll jump on the rocket again, right? It's the yeah. middle period where I have responsibilities. That means I'm going to be a little more conservative about it. Okay. It is funny, though, isn't it? Like, I mean, you you mentioned the money. You know, the the there's once you remove money from the equation. I mean, it would be amazing to get to that point where, you know, we have all the resources we need, so there is no need for anyone to want for anything. If that could, if you could accomplish that by by hopping on an asteroid and and mining whatever you need, that and thus removing all the need to 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 deal with the stuff down here. I mean, it'd be amazing. But uh, again, as you say, it's little tiny steps, and also just as a species, we're not particularly good at sharing. You know what I mean? Like we're just not, mm -hmm. we kind of suck at that. So, Yeah. I was, I was making a joke well, the other day. <laughs> I was making a joke the other day about like people who go to space and stuff like that. And uh, there was a movie that we were watching. I think it might've been like event horizon or, or something oh, yeah. like that. Yeah. And, uh, that you know, was like, fun. That was dark, though. That's a dark, yeah, we can talk oh. about that in a minute. I'd love yeah, to talk yeah. about that movie with you guys. Also, there's a movie called Sunshine that I'll, ch I'll chat with you guys oh, about yeah. in a minute. Oh, yeah, another too. great one. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was just like, I was laughing, and I'm like, people who like have families are always like the weakest link in a space movie because they're always the ones who are like freaking out yeah, about yeah, getting home. Yeah. And I'm like, I feel like if you have a large family or just a small family, if you just, if you're married, it has a significant other, you're like disqualified from going to space. Mm. <laughs> Cause Certainly if you go in the movies, yeah, yeah, especially in the movies, like they're always the ones who like freak out and ruin everything for everybody else. It's like, I gotta get home to my family. And they like hit the emergency <laughs> escape hatch or something like that. It's, it's just funny to me watching, um, our perception of like how movies movie makers perceive uh, astronauts and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but is the, uh, Dr. Target, do you have um, a particular 
movie that has to do with space travel that you think is just like freaking nails it? Like, this is what it's going to be like. Well, my, uh, well, no, not what it's going to be like, but Apollo 13 is probably one of the greatest movies That's fantastic. ever made. Mm, I just yeah. I just love... No, of course, you know, it's, it's slightly exaggerated reality, but it's the closest to a genuine, amazing space drama. It's well acted, it's well produced, it's well made. It is one of mm. my absolute favorite movies. There's only one significant flaw in that, which is when... So you've got the Earth, and they're coming back to the Earth. They have to change their angle of entry, mm -hmm. and they do it by pointing their ship at the Earth and accelerating forward. And I'm like, that's a bad idea. Now you're at the wrong angle, but you're going faster. Yeah. Like, what you actually have to do is turn your ship 90 degrees to the Earth and thrust up to change the angle of approach. Mm. I understand why they did that, because it's more dramatic. You know, It would be weird if they were just pointing at nothing yeah. and thrusting yeah. that way. People wouldn't understand. So that, that, that part they did, that was a deliberate known thing. But apart from that, it's just a spectacular watch from from beginning to end. And what I think, uh, where I think things might be going more like, I think The Expanse is one of the best examples of space travel as it's more likely to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you have examples there is, you know, you're not just warping or zipping around from one place to another. You're accelerating at 9.81 meters per second to simulate gravity. You're burning in this direction and you're flipping around and slowing down mm -hmm. in the other direction. That is the future of travel in our solar systems. And I think it's something that a lot of TV shows don't deal with well necessarily is the limitation of the speed of light within a mm. solar system and within a galaxy and the implications of what that would look like. Because unfortunately, the speed of light doesn't make for good sci-fi. If I shoot you with a laser, you're hit before you see the laser. Right. Also, when it comes to explosion, like just imagine that I do what Stargate has done and blow up a star. Like I could mm. blow up the sun right now and it's an eight minute wait until mm. we even notice it. So if you're sitting there in your ship and someone blows it, you're like, oh, the star's blown up. And you're like, all right, well, I'm just going to get a coffee and then we'll... Yeah. <laughs> Three, right. two, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. CNA. <laughs> you know, like, you know, if you're floating around at the edge of Jupiter and you see the sun blow up, you're like, oh, you know, I can, I can go for a nap, you know, like whatever. It's just, it's mm. just, it takes so long for things to happen because of the limit of the speed of light. And it's one of the things I loved about Stargate was that when they travel around solar systems, they talk about these hour long, even though they have this sci fi tech, they're not saying we'll be there in 10 minutes. You know, with the Enterprise, it's often mm. like, hey, zip over here, do this. And say, no, 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 no. If you start to get near those kind of velocities, as I said, if you travel even a quarter of the speed of light, you may get there in a couple of hours, but unfortunately, back in Atlantis, about 10 years has passed mm -hmm. while you've made your two-hour journey. That's special. And it's the dullest television you've yeah, ever yeah. watched. <laughs> you know, yeah. An episode where McKay goes to you know, a nearby moon, comes back, and everyone's died of old age is yeah. not thrilling. It's an 18-episode arc. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just him traveling for 18 yeah, episodes, yeah, comes back. And, straight line, yeah. so. So that's just, that's, that's just that's griping to himself in the corner. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't exactly. pick enough sandwiches. What am I saying? That's genius. That's genius <laughs> yeah. television. Film it. Um, have you, what did you make of uh, The Martian? Because I, I remember that I read that book and then watched the movie. And I mean, again, they're very different. But I, mm -hmm. I, I, I really enjoyed what he was doing with that, I thought. I loved yeah. both the book and the movie. We actually yeah. interviewed him in our seminar series here at Sonoma State. We got oh, to yeah. do a, a remote interview. And the great thing about it was he even showed us the little computer simulations he'd written to chart out the orbital trajectories wow. of the ship. So the reason I love that so much is it almost felt like that book was written for scientists. It was written because yeah. everything he does is is scientifically justified. Now, yeah. here's, here's the wondrous thing about that. The only thing that he did, he actually did this deliberately wrong. And mm -hmm. he told us about this in the interview. So the premise, spoiler alert, if this is the beginning, right? But something goes wrong on Mars. And in the book and in the movie, there's a huge Martian storm which creates the problem that then is the trigger for the rest of the story. Now, here's the thing about Martian storms in that the Martian atmosphere is so unbearably thin. Like there's almost, it's almost nothing. It's made almost nothing. Even a 400 mile an hour wind on Mars would feel like to a human, nothing more than the equivalent of a very light breeze. Oh. <laughs> Maybe moving quickly, but there's almost nothing. Yeah. Right, that's it. Now, now he knows this, but he deliberately did it nonetheless because he wanted the disaster that triggered the movie to be a natural disaster. He didn't want it to be like human arrogance, like, oh, we didn't take care of the reactor, right. or we did this. So right. I love that he was both aware of that and still chose to have it mm -hmm. be like that because he wanted it to be, you know, it was no one's fault that it happened. Mm -hmm. He didn't want it to be about blame. And so it's things like that. But he, he put in so much effort to that, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. like, I remember reading that book the first time. Oh. I was just riveted because, like, yeah, me too. Believed, oh, my God, he's telling me how he's going to make water. He's yeah. telling me how he's going to, like, mm -hmm. it was, it was like the good parts about Stargate that we talked about cranked up 
Mm. again as well where he'd literally go through all of the thoughts along the way. it reminded me of reading zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and i skipped all of the philosophy stuff and just wanted to know how the bike worked <laughs> you know what i mean and the, and that was just like it was just all of the good stuff i thought in the martian There's what also, about radiation that always drives me crazy that radiation yeah. is one of those things that everyone ignores radiation yeah. or they take a pill for it and it's like gone yeah <laughs> you know i think it would be a much sadder <laughs> film if he just died of cancer like a few months later on Mars, yeah, like, you know, sort of, yeah. But um, yeah, radiation. So uh, as you talked about in an interview with uh, with Mika, you know, we have the Earth's magnetic field that protects us from radiation. Mm -hmm. Now, Mars once had a magnetic field because it had a liquid metal core, just like our Earth. But because mm -hmm. Mars is Mars is only one tenth the size of the Earth, it's pretty tiny. Mm -hmm. So that metal core cooled down a long time ago, and it was the loss of that magnetic field that probably contributed fairly substantially to Mars becoming the barren wasteland that it is mm -hmm. today. So if you're traveling in space over long periods, you want to make sure you have protection from the hard radiation that exists in space. Mm. And you can do this by having, you know, you want to, I, you know, having like, even just something like a water tank around you is a good idea or lots of material to block this kind of stuff. Yeah, and on Mars, you would be subject to, yeah, yeah, that's the, I take the blue whale approach to it. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> a, it's a, so yeah, certainly- I got layers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many you uh, need? Yeah. Yeah, plenty. <laughs> that so hab was- like, if you could, Sorry, I've got, I don't mean to go. Yeah, okay, go ahead, go ahead. I want to hear it. it if you could somehow like remelt the core of Mars, could that then create the magnetics that you need to, to, to gain an atmosphere? Yep. And if you have any idea how we can do that, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> it's, it's, it would be one of the most important well, things. Well, if right? movies have taught me anything, it's yep. that you just got to nuke it. Yeah. Yep. Here's, <laughs> yes. Here's a better option. Let's, let's start firing comets at Mars because comets have, first mm. of all, a lot of water, which is great. Mm. And also the, the, the heat energy from the impact would be phenomenal. So mm. ironically, one of the best ways to make Mars, we're never going to be able to terraform Mars, but here's a word that most people don't know, which is a ecoplanesis. Ecoplanesis means to make a planet as Earth-like as the physical properties of the planet will allow. Mm. So we're never going to be able to make Mars, you know, step outside the door, take a deep breath, go for a nice walk kind of place, but we can make it significantly less deadly. Mm. And that's what that's what I mean. So, and one of the steps to do that might be well to pick up a bunch of comets from the Oort cloud and start bombarding Mars because you deposit ah. water and give it a bunch of heat energy, which and build up the mass of the planet. So that's uh, this is my excuse for being. What could go wrong with that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's this is my excuse yeah. for doing something massively destructive on a, right, on a right. solar system scale. But yes, if you could reliquify the Martian core, you could reestablish the magnetic field, rebuild an atmosphere. And mm. Mars once did have liquid water on its surface when it had these things and turn it into a mm. much more Earth-like planet. I would love mm. to do that. Mm. That's fascinating. I like it. So, I'm already thinking about how you can nuke it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. We've got to drill a hole first, and then we yeah, have to yeah. aim for that hole. <laughs> it, it won't be, you'd love to just drill into the core. and Because uh, if you think about what keeps our, the core of our Earth molten, it's a lot of radioactive material. So if anything, mm. you drill into the core and just dump huge amounts of uranium. I know where we can get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the material, dump it in there to reliquify. That's probably so one of the better ways. So we dump the we dump waste from reactors into yeah. the core. We got this worked out. This yeah, is, well, we're figuring out right here on the we live in a Mars podcast. In no time. Yeah, yep, yep. we're gonna call Elon. He's gonna support us. Yeah, yeah. We got. We're good to go. There you go. <laughs> that actually, that this whole conversation really reminds me, and the chat as well is is going crazy over this. Uh, that movie, The Core, where they have oh, to yeah. Re yeah, they yeah, have yeah, to yeah. reignite yeah. the uh, the Earth's core in order to get the, um, the electromagnetic shield around us. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that seems legit. So there's actual real science behind that. Like that's not just nonsense. Well, there's not science between you because the thing is, if you drill into the Earth. You encounter magma very rapidly. Right. Like in, in those movies, it's always just rock, you know. But really, mm. we are, if you think about the, the crust of the earth, we're just this tiny little sheet of rock floating around on liquid, mm. on, 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 on liquid magma. And that's something that's, that, you know, it's, it would be very different. How much would, of that Guinness would you say? Would yeah, you yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. The tip of the iceberg, right? He blew my mind when he said 5% of the universe yeah. is like, I know. The, the, that's crazy. That's here's insane. the other thing about space. Like, so, so here's a statement that's true unless you live in Los Angeles. So for everyone on this planet, you're closer to space right now than you are to Los Angeles. Huh. Like spa space is only about 100 miles above your head. Hmm. So it's not, we live on this, this, the atmosphere of our planet is incredibly thin hmm. and incredibly delicate. And that is the sort of thing that it's, I mean, and Shatner for all of his flowery language, that's what he said when he came back from his, uh, his, his, his suborbital flight. Mm. Uh, was that he, you could see how thin this layer of atmosphere that we are completely dependent. And over that 100 miles, only 
the bottom like one or two yeah. percent is is survivable. So we live mm. in a really fragile, fragile system, and that's, that's one a, of the things. We talked to this um, to Candy Medusa, this um, this oceanographer who um, uh, who went out on a boat to 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 bring in plastics to see to see how much mm -hmm. plastic had sort of inundated the plant the um, the oceans, and she said that they got to a point where they found plastics. And it was the closest humans to them were on the space station. Yeah. Like that's like, that's how remote a part of the ocean yeah. they were in. And you sort of go like, wait a second, how does that work? But of course, again, it's not that far up. Not like that it far feels, up. You know? Yeah. Uh, real quick. I just wanted to thank everybody who's watching. We got up to 50 watchers uh, at once, which is great. Thank you guys all for being here. Uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please support us. Hit the subscribe button. Yeah, and, do. Uh, they're amazing. And uh, thank you, David. <laughs> and uh, don't forget it's guys. It's like heaven. I love hanging out with you, man. This is my favorite thing to do. Um, if you guys want to support the channel, hit the super chats. We're going to be addressing them in probably about 15 minutes. We're going to read some of the super chats and have a conversation about those. So if you want to support the channel and get your chat read, uh, drop a drop a dollar super chat or whatever it is, whatever you guys got, and uh, we'll star it. We'll read it in a little bit. You guys do um, Patreon as well? Are you doing that? We do, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and they get um an incredible amount of content. We do four exclusive shows for our patrons every single month, and then on top of that, we do trivia night. Uh, we have um we have Firefly trivia. We we go, dude. We're so <laughs> desperate to quit our jobs. We're just like, please, <laughs> we're putting everything out there. Um, but yeah, we'd we'd love to have the support, guys. SaltyNerdClub.com is where you can go if you want to support the channel and become a Patreon. Uh, like I said, tons of exclusive content and uh, really cool stuff that we do for our Patreon members. There's a ton of them in the chat right now who actually are patrons. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask them, and we can get some testimonies in the chat going on. Um, but real quick, I wanted to um, ask uh, you guys something. So, uh, uh, David, have you watched this TV show? Uh, I think it was on HBO, uh, starring Hugh Laurie, who plays House. Uh, but he's a he's an astronaut. He's a, he. It's like oh, a big no Avenue Q. Yeah, Avenue Five. Avenue, Avenue five. five. Avenue Five. No, I haven't Ma seen that. I, okay. I keep meaning to do it. It's it's actually like low key brilliant, hilarious mm. because it, it's so out there and weird. But they are traveling through space on basically like a cruise liner. Mm. And uh, though we were talking about the radiation a little bit ago and how like you can just have a layer of something around you to protect you from the from from the radiation and in this show they address that by saying all the human waste that is given to the ship because they have thousands of people on this ship they they pipe it around the ship in these like intricate piping systems and it's just all the radiation is blocked by human poop ah, lovely. <laughs> and uh, lovely. there's a there's an episode where one of the pipes breaks um, and there's like just human poop coming out of the of the pipe and floating around the ship because it's got it's got its own gravitational pull. And I was just wondering, I'm like, Professor Target, would that actually work? Can you have a line of human waste protect you from radiation? This is why it be radioactive as well, though. I mean, like in that it's coming out of the humans that have been irradiated. I mean, uh, that's it's, a good question. It's it, it, so anything you bombard with radiation becomes a little bit radioactive in return, but the idea is at least it's spread out and it can still block other kinds of radiation. It's not a terrible idea, but I wouldn't like it to be my primary mechanism of defense against death mm. in space. I'd have to so disagree with you. I think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've dealt with nappies. And yeah, I, I don't, true. you know, I never want to go back there in any kind it's, of a large scale way. It, it just yeah. seems to me that it's such a it would be a wasted resource because what are you going to do with it otherwise? Like, what would be, to, yeah, like, but it doesn't have to be oh, the Martian made, made potatoes, yep. yeah, yep. exactly. No, so, the I, idea I, of reprocessing it makes sense for mm -hmm. sure. You know, that's a lot, a lot of the, I mean, that's one of the other things about, about the science exploration, about the um, space exploration that I love is, is all the molecular biology side of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other, I mean, if you love space but don't love the, the you know the astrophysics side of it, there's all sorts of, of you know molecular biology and, and, and genetic engineering and all sorts of stuff as well that, yeah. that it all comes into play. There's so many different things involved. It's amazing. So here's a fun story about radiation in space. So and, uh, when astronauts are up in the space station, they try to sleep. They obviously Velcro themselves to the wall so they don't float around the space station. But as, they close, love. As, as they close their eyes and try to go to sleep, they notice that occasionally there'd be this sort of bright flash of light even though their eyes were closed. And it would be mm. like, oh, they sort of wake up. Well, what's that? You know, like, how do I, why did that happen? So they, they close their eyes again and go to sleep. Another bright flash of light. And we couldn't figure it out. And it turns out that there are things called uh, cosmic rays, which is where you take an individual proton, usually in something like a supernova somewhere in the universe, and, ex and the explosion of the supernova can accelerate individual protons up to like 99.99999% speed of light. 
And these flashes of light were individual atoms, individual protons flying through the aqueous solution of their eyes and coming out the other side. Now, this isn't that damaging to you because you know it's just it's just one individual atom, right? And you're, it's it's nothing compared to what you are or anything like that. So it's not really damaging you that much. But because it's going so fast, as it passes through this aqueous solution in your eyes, sometimes it, it can even exceed the speed of light in water. So the speed of light is different within different materials. Mm. And so as a result, when you when you do that, you get a flash of light. So these astronauts were literally seeing flashes of light inside their eyes from individual atoms flying through them. Like that. Mm. And those kind of things you can't really block. It doesn't really hurt you that much. You can you can you you can recover from that. But it's sort of things that are so strange that happen in space that don't happen here on the Earth. You know, we are mm. not well adjusted to exist in space. Yeah, um, astronauts who are up there for an extended period of time, they have serious issues when they come back to Earth's gravity, right? They're mm. like their bones yeah. are a little bit less dense, and their heart uh, grows, I think, in size. I believe I've heard I've yep. read that somewhere. So it's um, how do we how do we compensate for that if we want to do something long term in space? Yeah, so astronauts in microgravity environments, because there is gravity in space, like uh, astronauts in orbit of the Earth have almost the same gravitational acceleration as we do down here. It's just because they're falling out of the sky, which is what orbit is, they don't feel it. They mm. have to spend a huge amount of their day working out. And mm. that is just, it doesn't stop the decay. That it takes just, me out right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Get this astronaut <laughs> thing, I'm out. It just, uh, it just diminishes the effect, right? So really, mm. if you're talking about long-term space exploration, you really would want to simulate gravity and probably through some kind of rotation mechanism. But here's, here's a thing that people don't think about that much. Let's say that we do move to Mars, okay? So mm -hmm. the Martian gravity is about one third that of the Earth. So you could jump three times as high as you could do on this. You could do any number of things like that. Your, your, your golf drive would suddenly improve massively. Mm -hmm. But if you then go on to have children on Mars, the development of those children will be strongly impacted by this developing in this reduced gravitational environment. So they would naturally grow to probably be much, much taller than they would here on Earth, but they would also be much more streamlined and their bones would only be as dense as they needed to be mm -hmm. to support themselves. And now if you move to a planet that had a stronger gravitational pull than the Earth, your children would grow up to be a race of like super strong hobbits. Because mm -hmm. the bodies would have to develop. <laughs> so basically you're talking elves and dwarfs, right? In these two. Well, the Expanse areas. deals with that too, which the I Expanse love as well. They, they have drugs to keep them, to keep them thing, but yeah. they never deal with mm -hmm. stopping the height from going taller. But yeah, mm -hmm. if, well, if, don't if, they have some of the? Aren't the belters? Aren't the belters? Yeah, of, well, the belters. Like, I think they got too expensive. They just stopped yeah, using yeah. those tall, super tall <laughs> things. Yeah. But if, if you grow up on Mars, unless you have these sci-fi drugs, you're you're not coming back. Like mm. you'd never be able to return to the Earth if you developed, because even if yeah, even if you spend a few months in space, it takes you a long time to recover. And the really fun thing to watch with astronauts, someone made a, a montage of this, is that they get so used to being in a microgravity environment, they keep doing things like putting a pencil and just sort of letting it go. And then they're shocked that it's not just hanging there, like because that's what you know. Yeah. It's amazing, you know, even though it's tough to live in space, it's a testament to how wondrous the human mind and adaptability and the adaptability mm. we have that they can get used to operating in these kind of unnatural environments. Yeah, the the elast what is it the elasticity the alex the alex I can't say it I can't say, I can't say, the I can't say elasticity it. that's the one yeah <laughs> some words that I'm just not going to say without enough coffee uh, of our brains is just extraordinary like what we can get used to and what we can we can acclimatize ourselves to is amazing. And yeah. kids are the best example. Like, all oh, this is why you're saying all kids start life as natural scientists, right? I mean, mm. science is nothing more than building models of things in your head. And one of the reasons mm. that children are so useless to begin with is because they have no models of anything. And mm. the example I use with my class is that, you know, you probably have a model of the people in your life that are really important to you. Like, I could, in my head, I have a model of my mother, say, and I could mm. ask that model a question. I could say, oh, mother, I've decided to quit my job as an astronomer and join the Argentine Navy, right? And I could probably mm. guess what her response to something like that would be without actually having to ask her the question. Right. Now, that's an example of what science is. It's just with things instead of people. Mm. Right? And, so, and that's why children are so adaptable and so flexible. It's because they don't have the models. If you raise a child on Mars, to them, being able to jump 12 foot in the air is a it's fairly normal. easy thing. It's completely normal. Mm. Like yeah, they, mm. they would just, it's the software part of us that makes us makes us adaptable and that's one mm. to see it, this isn't really your expertise but on a human evolution standpoint like how long do you think it would take us to uh adapt to a new planet like that would you take generations are we talking like yeah five six my grandfather's grandfather was from earth and now i'm like normal yeah, a little Mars. engineering a little yeah. <laughs> we'll have ourselves sorted out in a, in a couple a couple of generations yeah, I think, uh, I, I think we're at a stage where technology will drive human development far faster than evolution could ever hope to do so. I mean, you know, we already, 
you know, our lifespan, we, you know, most of us now, especially, you know, in the, with the privilege we have, enjoy qualities of quality of life that would be previously reserved for like insane Roman emperors on a day to day mm -hmm. basis. Like mm -hmm. one of the things I'm most grateful for in life is that almost any day I can choose what I have for lunch. Like that's mm -hmm. hasn't been true for like 99.9% .9 of humanity and yeah. isn't true for most of humanity that exists today. Right. So I think if we were to live on Mars, I think it would be technology that would be the determining factor, not the sort of life and death struggles of, mm. of centuries and millennium and of, of, of evolution. Yeah, we so our, our you know our systems and our beliefs and and the the sort of structures of our or, of our of our government organizations. I mean, I feel like they're the things that are holding us back on this stuff now. I mean, if we were to truly, if you truly want to go and explore space and live on other planets, it you know instead of trying to form the planet to the to to our needs, we should be doing this you know should be doing that to us i mean mm -hmm. it, this i mean i remember reading a really interesting article about like you know had we approached things differently in our own evolution you know we put up lights so that we could see at night we could we could also have genetically engineered our eyes to allow us to see at night yeah. when they needed the lights you know i mean that kind of stuff or glow in the dark stuff or whatever i mean i feel like it's there's so many different things coming together now that will make this possible but there's uh there's some really interesting things going on in the uh um Gen genetics field uh, i was mm -hmm. watching this documentary on netflix uh it was about CRISPR. it was about that like genetically altering right. yourself and uh, it was some pretty scary stuff to be honest with you i was watching this i'm like that doesn't sound like a good idea if you ask me but there was this uh gentleman who was doing tests he, he ran like a dog kennel or something like that and he oh, was yeah. like he was trying to yeah, genetically i know david yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you yeah. do yeah yeah oh yeah oh I'm man a nerd, he was... man i'm a nerd <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> yeah he was brilliant. trying yeah. to um he was trying to genetically alter dogs to have bioluminescence mm. so that they would like glow in the dark. And I'm like, that's yeah. freaking crazy that you can even conceive that idea and then put it to practice and start well, testing it. But get this. So one of the things he ran up against was one of the things he wanted to do was there is a genetic trait. There's a genetic issue. I'm sorry, Todd. We've gone completely off topic. <laughs> um, uh, they're space dogs. They're, they're dogs. They'll float in space. Uh, space dogs. Yes. Um, but one of the things he came up against was that he was looking for a solution to this horrible condition that I think it was Dalmatians get. Mm -hmm. that you breed these Dalmatians and they've, that they've been so inbred for so long that they all, they can get this horrendous painful, miserable disease, which he wanted to genetically cure with sort of a gene drive that would get rid of this of this sort of section of their DNA. And he was he was told by the, you know, the Dalmatian Association that that meant that they weren't Dalmatians anymore. So they couldn't they wouldn't count as Dalmatians. So it's just this kind of these weird societal issues that we have with this stuff, you know. Yeah, um, I, I think I mean, if that's going to be something that we can do, like we can genetically alter ourselves to adapt better to space travel or something like that. Mm. Like, uh, you know, uh, there's I think there's ways around that. We're very we're very good at uh, problem solving when it comes to Tom. Humor. What would you say would be a good one to what would be a good change? What would be a good genetic change for to survival stop our bodies from completely decaying in the absence of a gravitational field? Like that uh, would be kind of like the drug in the expanse. You know, you would just. Mm. Because it's not so much that, it, that, that's not even making us better. It's just stopping us from our body's natural, much like, uh, so our bodies are kind of like students. They want to exist in the lowest energy state possible at all time, mm. right? So just, with you. just stopping them from, it's not even about making them better. It's just not making themselves worse mm -hmm. would even be just step one, right? To turn, now, to, to, to turn that off would be a huge development. Mm -hmm. right? so, should we do some uh, super chats? And, uh, yeah, let's. Yeah, it's sweet. actually perfect time. It's about an hour and a half in, guys. We're gonna switch over to. Are we really? Oh my chats. god! I Pilots, know it's crazy. time dilation. <laughs> <laughs> so our first super chat was from Backyard Tardis, who is a Patreon member. Nick, how you doing, buddy? It's good to see you. Thank you for the five dollars. Says, "Wow, Mika and now Thomas Target, David Hewlett, getting to hang out with a lot of smart people." <laughs> Like so, Zelenka, you, yeah, uh, <laughs> five bucks to get that little jab in. Is that like it? Is it worth it to you? Was it worth the five bucks? I hope so. Backyard Tardis. No, this is what I said. Is like this is the joy of doing what I do, is that I get I get to do all of this when I'm when I'm not acting. I get to I get to, to like learn stuff because mm -hmm. you know it, it it's it's yeah. I mean, and thank you, Tom, for 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 doing this because it's just it's fascinating. Yeah, me. My my pleasure. And the thing about the, the reason I love mentioning the reason I love Zelenka as a character in that show as well. Is because we talked about. I'll you know, just stop you there. Yeah, no, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> thin ice, David, or no, thin ice target, thin ice. We talked about why I loved, you know, like McKay already, right? But Zelenka is kind of not the mirror parallel, right? You know, mm -hmm. like like McKay is the one you want to 
to keep you alive for another 10 minutes, like, you know, to, to break the back of the immediate crisis. Zelenka is the one you want for the long term, yeah, yeah. day to day yeah. grind of life. Yeah. You know, you, Rodney's not the kind of guy you'd put on that kind of thing. You'd, Zelenka is the is the guy you really want to work with to solve these big problems over a long period. And yeah, that's, yeah. Why, so that's why that's, it's good to have these two characters because you get to see this this interplay between these two elements of the reality of science, the long term slow part, and the craziness of oh my god, mm. there's an asteroid field, there's a blah blah, blah things like that that we need. To it's get. so I lo I loved it because it was just a very sort of like an old married couple. It was just it was just a this sort of like begrudging respect. You yeah, know. yeah. And then you actually got to work with real scientists in the later episode, in season five, as I remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. With, with um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and, uh, and uh, Bill Nye? Yeah. You mean, or, yeah, yeah. What, 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 uh, were they, what were they like on set? Oh, God, they're hilarious. They were, they were just <laughs> hilarious. They were just having so much fun. They're, the great thing about scientists are, well, from what, I've, from what I've seen, the ones that I've met and the ones that I've enjoyed being with, they're kids mm -hmm. because they've never lost that curiosity. They've, they love talking about, about stuff. They love figuring stuff out. They're always asking questions. Um, you know, even on set, it's just, you know, like, okay, how does that work? What does this do? What is, I mean, which is me on set like that. So it was just, I felt I was, you know, I, I just absolutely loved it. So I actually got to two of the Stargate sets and I touched everything, like literally <laughs> anything that could be well, touched. Have that washed, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's pre-COVID, right? It's a long time ago. So it's, it's not, but. Yeah, when the world was safer. <laughs> it is amazing, though, that some of the stuff on um, that that shows up on on um, I mean, the the, stu this, the way this stuff looks on film compared to what it's some of it's like in real in the real world. There's some stuff I was like, you know, I get told off because I bumped the styrofoam that was, you know. It was one mm. of the walls and stuff, so, you know. And those bubblers just got weird, more and more grungy the longer we ran. So, you know. uh, that's, something no one, and that's something no one ever deals with. Like you know, all the time it was always windows breaking, and I always imagined that Atlantis had a team of like glaziers who had to go around. <laughs> after each week right, here we go again window. with it. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, to, yeah, they were recruited from Earth as like the elite glaziers, and they were sent yeah, out. Yeah. They were yeah. given security clearance just so they could fix windows. It's maintenance. <laughs> there has to be a maintenance crew. Yeah. There has yeah, to be yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we got a two dollar super chat from JT. Thanks, JT. Also a Patreon member. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. It says, "Ask Tom about the movie Sunshine." Uh, mm. David, you said you've seen Sunshine. Yeah, I loved it. I loved Did it. you have any questions about it? Like the real, because like humans do, they immediately wanted to blow up whatever wasn't working in that movie. Mm. Um, do you want to ask a, a Target about the science behind that? I, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen it, so I honestly okay. don't remember. A oh, okay. Lot of it. it felt very real to me. Like mm -hmm. it, it felt like it covered a lot of stuff really well. Um, you know, I'm, have you seen it at all recently? Yeah, we covered it on last week's podcast. I think. Damn I it! Think. I should know that. <laughs> it might really? be out. I'm not sure if. Uh, yeah, that episode should like. I think it came out on Friday. I remember um, but, being slightly disappointed at the end, but yeah, but it was as always. It's yeah. You know, it, it, they they went like it always real goes crazy and start stabbing each other. It's always yeah. yeah. They went a bit nuts with the. It was actually it was a better movie at the beginning half because they actually did a fantastic spacewalk in that movie mm, where yeah. uh, their their uniforms was like this huge giant suit of like gold plated mm. uh, whatever. It was giant though. It looked like like a, one of those old school uh, uh, scuba diving uh, mm. wetsuits or whatever. They're just giant thing. But they went out and they were repairing a piece of the ship and uh, they were so close to the sun. Basically, they had this giant sun shield that would protect the actual ship from the radiation and from the sun's uh, heat and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know if heat is heat the right word for that. I see that again. Dr. Target. It is. It's okay. Infrared radiation. Technically, okay. if you want to sound fancy, but what does infrared radiation mean? It means heat. Heat. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, I'm I was... going to watch that one again because I remember being just blown away by how beautiful it was. Yeah, it was a gorgeously done movie. Um, what do you think? What's that? Does, does it make sense? So this is when they're trying to reignite, you know, get this, get the sun going again. Right? Yes, yeah, the yeah. sun is dimming down, and it's not providing the amount of uh, heat and radiation that the Earth needs. So the Earth is getting colder. So they send two ships out, and basically with like a nuclear device to uh, shoot it into the sun, blow it Told up you. to. To yeah, make it the answer. Make it bigger and brighter. <laughs> I think it's like, like we always overestimate how like nukes may be impactful here on the Earth. But they're pretty much meaningless in a astronomy context, right? I mean, mm -hmm. as much of the damage from a nuclear device is created by the compressed air shockwave in our atmosphere. Right. Whereas ah. in space, there's no shockwave, so there's no atmosphere, so no shockwave. So nukes create a beautiful light show, but then pretty much useless, mm -hmm. right? So here's the thing with the sun. So the sun will start to do two things. It'll start to expand as it runs out of fuel. Mm -hmm. And that will cause it, you know, that it causes it to get dimmer, but it also causes us to, it also gets a little bit, it gets colder 
sorry, but it gets, I got it the wrong around. As the star expands, it gets uh, a little bit colder, but it also gets brighter. Mm. Now, here's the thing about saving our sun, because our sun is going to run out of fuel in about 4 billion years, and we'll notice the first effect of that in about 1 billion years. Hmm. So now what do I mean by running out of fuel? Now, the energy source of the sun is nuclear fusion. Not hmm. nuclear fission, like in an atomic bomb, but nuclear fusion, where you take hydrogen, slam it together to make helium. Hmm. Now, this only happens in the inner 10% or core of the sun. So as our sun runs out of fuel, the irony is the core of the sun will become less and less hydrogen and more and more helium. But mm. it's still surrounded by the other 90% of the sun, which still has a ton of hydrogen. So mm. what you really want to do if you wanted to extend the life of the sun is not nuke it, because that'd be pretty much, pretty much nothing. You'd want to find a way to cycle all of that lovely hydrogen that it still has in it into the core. Back into the core. And the fusion. Mm. So the, the sun has more fuel than it needs. The problem is it only uses it in that core in that okay. core. You, so you what want you'd to, want to like surround it and crush it back in on itself yeah. and then you want to find a way to take out the ash we call it helium ash because just like mm. once you burn wood on a fire you're left with ash that can't burn you mm. want to strip out the helium ash from the core of the sun and put it now the reason that's hard is because it's in the very middle of the sun where the temperature is about 15 million degrees mm. so i don't know how fancy a spacesuit is there's no way you mm. get that kind of temperature so it's a fun premise but it really like new any movie where uh, you solve a problem in space by nuking it is probably not a really right. accurate yeah. representation. You need to do you know, like ge like spatial engineering on scales that we can't possibly even comprehend yet. Again, it's not as cinematic to watch yeah, them yeah. fully build right. something around yeah. the sun and then yeah. 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 <laughs> the beam in that does something and everyone yeah. says, well, "Oh, great! Oh, that was good." Yeah, like yeah. did you see the beam? Yeah, I loved it. And then One blow the... it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And nuke it. Yeah, yeah. One of the other things that that movie did that I thought was really interesting was the sun shield that protected mm. the ship. So the ship is a long, narrow, it looks very much like the International Space Station. It's a very long, narrow set of like compartmentalized sections. And uh, in front of it is this giant dome that basically shields it from the radiation. Uh, is that something that's even feasible? Do we have something that can take the amount of radiation and heat coming off the sun once you get closer to it? So if you're going to do space shielding, you kind of want to do what the Earth is doing but artificially. So you wouldn't want a physical type of blocking mechanism. You would want a powerful electromagnetic field. So the idea mm, isn't to ah. block or absorb what's coming from the sun. It's just to, to divert it around yeah, you. Right? That's right. what you need. You need, just like the enterprise has a navigational deflector, you need an incredibly powerful energy source at like at least a nuclear reactor, preferably even like a fusion reactor. So mm. this is what the sun does. And to, mm. if you ask me, this is the, I, I'm of the hope that we can save our species and grow into the future using technology mm. and for me the great hope of our civilization as an energy dependent technological civilization is fusion power and there are mm. actually fusion uh this is, salt for, this is the salt the salt cooled one yeah is this, 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 is, this is the kind of processes yeah where you mm. where, where you work with that so we're actually building model fusion reactors around the world and there are problems that we still need to solve this is not a, a hit you know this is not a 10 20 even 30 year kind of technology but those kind of things could make the difference and especially in this kind of situation Gener until we have the ZPM, generating the sheer amount of power you need to create these electromagnetic shields rather than physical. Oh, right. Sorry, I've got it wrong. I've got the wrong one. Sorry. You, you're talking about the ones that use the plasma to to uh, uh, to create the fusion and then yep, yep, it's all yep, contained yep. by magnetic. Laser, either laser induced fusion or just high energy fusion. Reactors. Laser. See, yep, yep. Alex, yep, yep. laser laser. Not far off. There you go. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, we haven't been able to build a react. We we weaponized it, of course, because that's what we do. So, yeah, like we use conventional explosives to set off uh, fission explosives to then set off fusion explosives. So we, mm. we've already turned it into a weapon. Now let's turn it into a way to save our species. Mm. Yeah. Weapons come first because there's more money behind it. Uh, all right, we got another super chat for two dollars. It's Canadian two dollars. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, super chat two from loonies. William. William journey. Portland. I have to say, I've been watching William in the chat, and he's been dropping some like really in-depth scientific equations, and I don't understand them, but I'm like fascinated. He must be like some kind of a, a, a scientist like you, Dr. Target. Uh, it says, I solved the UFT. I don't know what that is, but I'm sure Target does. Uh, but I needed a 4D calculator. Thoughts? So this is directed towards you, Professor. It ain't going to me. Yeah. <laughs> Not me either. I'll give you some thoughts. <laughs> No, this is a, it's, 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 it's one of the reasons that it's always fun to do something like this, because like in my classrooms, the biggest problem I have is trying to get people to listen to me. And yet here I have people who are voluntarily spending their time and their thought and energy, like listening to this conversation. So it's always quite, uh, it's always quite, uh, quite thrilling. What is UFT? 
I have to, this is what I'm trying to, I'm trying to rack my brain. Uh, I know this sounds, I have to, here's where I have to admit my own failings. It's not the, the, the initialism is not jumping out at me. It's something I'm familiar with. Universal so I, something? I, I, Universal yeah. flight time. Um, okay. Uniform. Yeah, I, <laughs> I like Universal it. flight time. I uh, if, if he's still in the chat, maybe he can, okay. Uh, yeah, let's, let's see. Here we can... go. Here, here oh, he is. Wow. He's in the chat right here. here we're going. We're going. Unified, oh, unified field, field theory. theory. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is also, oh, okay. you, you can also have GUT, like grand unified theory. That's right. I was thinking gut rather because I have one right. rather, mm -hmm. than, uh, rather than UFT. But um, yes, so this is, this actually comes back to our conversation about uh, quantum mechanics and things like that, right? So we have things happening at a quantum scale that seem almost like magic. And we have things happening on scales that are bigger than us, you know, universal scales that seem, that seem mysterious. And we have these wonderful scientific models but we don't have a one size fits all model. Mm. Now there is a trend towards this. And it used to be that electricity and magnetism were like their two separate spheres of influence, but we've united mm. them into electromagnetism. Mm. And that was one of the most powerful things in science to be able to take these two things and realize they were two sides of the same coin. So one of the biggest drivers going forwards is the hope that we can one day unify general relativity, which often governs things on the massive scales on these grand scales, with quantum mechanics, mm. right? To try and create a theory that can account for all of these phenomenon at once, rather than having these separate ideas which are overlapping magisteria, mm. like that. So yes, it would be, and he, he's right, but it required going to the fourth dimension. It's, it's I, I love the lines. I mean, remember at the end of um, like Back to the Future Part Three, where he's like, Marty, you're, you're not, not thinking, thinking fourth dimensionally. dimensionally. Right, you know, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you're not. Like, that's the exact point. So. I, I, I love the comment uh, we, we got there from that super chat because he's like, yeah, I, I solved the problem, but it required going beyond beyond mm -hmm. what the human mind can do. It's That's the same great. thing when we try and, when I try and expand, explain the expansion of the universe. It's it's not something I can do. It's not something any. It's not just me. No one else can really do it well, right? So the only way we can ex explain it is via analogy on a two dimensional level. We can explain mm. it like that. And I think your uh, Dial the Gate interview said, you know, expanding balloon. Do you come back around to the same point? That's mm. the same analogy I use, but. There's no way the human mind can create a visualization of, say, the Big Bang or the expansion of the universe. If you imagine the Big Bang, you imagine a big lot of blank nothing and a little dot that goes boom. Mm. But the Big Bang is not an explosion in space. It's an explosion of space. Of space yeah. And there's a big difference between that one little word. Like, there's no way to create. You would have to be able to think fourth dimensionally. You would have to time to you. Would have to, you'd have to exist at every moment in time simultaneously mm. to truly build a good picture Hmm. of the expansion of the year. So I, 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 love, I, I love that super chat. Did you fun. ever read a book called Flatland? Yes, Flatland is amazing. Because yeah. so that's this, fascinating. The idea of a, of a two-dimensional being seeing the world. Is that right? So have I got that right? You have. And, and the reason it's so powerful is not because, you know, learning, thinking about what life as a two-dimensional creature is like is interesting. But the mm. power of that book is helping the reader understand why their universe can look as mysterious as it does. It's like, hey, mm. we might look down upon this poor two-dimensional creature who can't understand the simplicity of a three-dimensional universe. Well, we are a poor three-dimensional creature who can't understand the complexity of this fourth-dimensional structure. That was right? the thing I got from it, this, like, yep. this sense of, like, by focusing in on the limitations of these beings, it suddenly made you very painfully aware of the limitations of our own, which yep. is just extraordinary. It's that humility. That's, 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 that's a very old-fashioned book. I remember yeah. correctly. It was very, I remember it being a bit hard work. Yeah. What's the name of that? that? A Flatland. Flatland. I wonder if it's yeah. an audible, uh, audible, because I'd love to listen to that. It might. Uh, be. Actually, speak, that might be a good way of doing it. Actually, because yeah. I, yeah, it's been a while. I, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of audiobooks. Uh, not because yeah. I'm, I like, to, I want to be a voice actor and read books for a living. That's my kind of my end goal for, for doing this channel is to transition. Into as long that, as it doesn't have a lot of names. Yeah, well, I, I can manage. I, I read weird names all the time, but, <laughs> um, audiobooks I think are such a great way for people to take in knowledge and, um. And we actually, oh, yeah, we do have an affiliate with uh, audiobooks, saltynerd.com slash audiobooks. You guys oh, there you can go. Get, I think, three months free or something like that. I did not mean to segue into that uh, freaking branding thing, but. No, but that's brilliant, uh, <laughs> though. See, yeah. look at that. It's built in. I do love On audiobooks. I think level, they're great. You yes. Kadish, Kadish is behind the scenes right now going, I know what he's thinking. <laughs> it's, it's funny. The audiobook stuff, I can, I can listen to nonfiction. I can't do fiction. I mm. just don't. There's something about it. There's too much, I guess, because I know too much of the acting side of it. That it bothers me if I get like a if someone gets an accent wrong or a mm. or the tone's not right or I need to read 
I need to read, um, you know, uh, in the, your the own stuff. in your own. But voice. the nonfiction, oh my god, bring it on! I mean, as yeah. long as it doesn't have lots of lists, I, it's Audible is great for that. Uh, so, uh, so we gotta get going because I know David's got it out uh, here in a little bit. Mm. Uh, for twenty dollars, super chat from Backyard Tardis. Thank you, sir. What? Nick, another see twenty bucks. Now you can insult me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Question for the group: Have any of you listened to the Sentinel Point of No Return? Chris Judge's new audio drama. Mm. Have you guys heard of that? No, I haven't either. We'll have to I would love to listen to Chris Judge. It. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out because I'm Constant like I said, splicing humans to better survive on other planets in our solar system. So we kind of talked I, about that a little bit. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Okay. I love See, I don't. I I'm of the uh, the Jurassic Park line of thinking. Like we don't know what we're doing. We should not be messing with our genetics. <laughs> yeah, but then we get dinosaurs. <laughs> we're yeah. gonna we're gonna create some weird freaking human hybrid, and they're gonna be like evil or something. Like ah, I think we should hold off on that for a I, little look, while. I think it's gonna happen anyways. Yeah, that's my thing is, and I just I worry that that North America and the Western world is gonna get behind on this stuff, and I want us to be. Mm. I think I think we need to know. I think we need to know what the rules are. And we know to know what's possible in order to be able to protect ourselves against stuff in the future. I mean, so do you think you think other parts of the world are already like ahead of the? Uh, ahead I of the would curve be amazed that? if China isn't already genetic. That's what I'm. Yeah, like do you, yeah. So like because I, because we're so hesitant to do it because of our culture, yeah, we're falling behind basically because other people are taking bigger chances. It's such a weird thing because I I am both. Uh, sort of enamored and appalled by China. Like I, I mm -hmm. you know, for obvious political and, and, and you know, uh, human rights sort of issues, I, I, I despair. But at the same time, the ability to turn around on a dime and say, okay, this will be the way our race will continue as, as a, you know, this is as if China rules the world, this is how we are going to see the future. They, they plan not in four year election cycles, but in, you know, in grand hundred year plans and stuff. Um, and that is very difficult for us to do. And it's also very difficult to, to, to have that in, in conjunction with, with, with human rights. Oh, so right. I'm, I'm appalled and, and attracted to it at the same time. Yeah. Here's a fun uh, DNA splicing thought. So as a kid, I remember seeing Jurassic Park and I still have fears about raptors, right? And the thing that helped me get over that was that if you were to, to just have to click my fingers and bring a velociraptor into this room right now, it wouldn't just instantly look at me and attack. It would be like, <gasps> and then fall over and die because the oxygen content of the earth That's was so, so much great. higher when dinosaurs are around that they'd just be like wheezy asthmatic things, like mm. barely able to survive. So that yeah. that made me feel a little better that I wasn't going to die of raptor attack. <laughs> no, I am more worry about the inequalities of like, you know, I just, the, the fact that, you know, what happens when you can, you can genetically increase your ability to remember things or to, mm. to process information or, you know, or any of these things. I mean, Did you yeah. that movie Gattaca? What, what was it called? Oh, this is, I recommend this. This is from like- Oh, Gattaca. Gattaca, yeah. yeah. So, oh, so, brilliant. So this, this, this is a wonderful exploration of this, right? Yeah. You know, it's not perfect and it's, it's, you know, it's a bit dated, but it's exploring the sort of social dynamics of what happens when you end up, you know, it takes the have, have not dynamic, except now your haves are genetically enhanced. So you end up mm. with a sort of bimodal species distribution of these kind of things. And that was- But that's that where was, we're going. I mean, yeah. that's like right now. I mean, that's like, if you've got, if you've got good insurance, then great. If not, then sorry. That's yep. the, your, 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 you know, your genetic line stops here, you know? Uh, yeah. JT's making, I'm a big dinosaur fan. You guys, most of the people in the chat know this about me. And uh, I knew already that the atmosphere is so different back then that there's no way, unless they were genetically I, that's modified. That's the first I've heard of that. I've never yeah. heard that. Yeah. It's, fair, they're constructed with the DNA of frogs and blah, right, blah. Yeah. Of course we can, we can, we can, we can. That's, that's movie so. mumbo jumbo. But yeah, yeah, yeah. essentially like we, do, um, I was listening to a podcast called science versus, and they were talking about science versus dinosaurs. And they were like, can huh. we recreate genetically modified dinosaurs to come back to life based off of DNA that was captured from fossils and stuff. And the short answer is no long answer is if you want to genetically modify a dinosaur, you're going to have to take a chicken and you're going to have to genetically modify it to resemble a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a dinosaur. You're just going to get a messed up looking chicken. So are it's like working on mam uh, mammoths as well. Woolly mammoths, mammoths are, are different because they're in that permafrost and there's still like active DNA and blood samples that they can get. And they can use some kind of this, some kind of a hairy elephant that exists yeah. already that they can use. Yeah, and they can splurge, you know, mix the two and, and splurge. This also brings us back to, we were talking about the difference <laughs> between a thousand and a million, like at the beginning. So mm. mammoths went extinct about 10,000 years ago. 
dinosaurs 64 million years ago. So there's oh, a wow. big difference wow. in terms of, yeah. of, of what you've got there, right? So it's understanding the difference between those numbers and why that's so significant. Yep. Ah. The next super chat is from Anima Kafusa. I think she's David Hewlett's biggest fan. Uh, she's in all of his live <laughs> streams. Says, David, has Jane seen your new haircut yet? And Alex, congrats on 50 viewers. Thank you so much. Anima, you're such a huge supporter of the podcast. Really appreciate it. I love seeing you in the chat and uh, hanging out with you on trivia. If you guys want to do Anima's trivia with us, she is Anima, awesome. Anima is always popping by for, for so. Tech bandits so, well. have you revealed your new haircut to anybody? I told her it was like a. I told her it was an Instagram filter. <laughs> they yes, do have that. She's seen it. She she's definitely seen it. She said, "I look forward to seeing it once it's had a few days to grow." So, oh, okay. Yeah. You get the little yeah. peach fuzz going on. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> the dog loves it because she wakes me up in the morning by licking my head. Oh no. Yeah. So if you no. get this part, are you going to keep it like that for the duration of filming and everything? I, You're just going to be. The, it's it's quite a long shot. It's an odd. It's a very different part for me. I don't see it happening. But I just okay. thought, you know what? I needed a haircut anyways, and you know, so why okay. not? Why not just do it? I, and also, uh, we're watching Breaking Bad. Baz and I are watching Breaking Bad. Oh, so I nice. Want to do a little Heisenberg, a little Heisenberg thing for him. Okay. Know, so. Well, if you have this all the way up until like October, you got to do a Halloween costume thing as Heisenberg. Oh yeah, that'd be Mr. amazing. Evil. Or Mr. Evil or Doctor yeah. Evil. Oh, right? Doctor Evil, that'd be yeah. great. Uh, yeah. Another five dollars from Backyard Tardis. Well, nobody is smart like McKay because he's comic book smart like Tony Stark, and that that goes to the the writers yeah, of these. Try yeah. beating fake smart. It's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, and this uh, is something you see like you know it's like it, it was you know you're watching the show and he's like oh just just give me five minutes you know just give me five minutes yeah. and me I'd be like oh yeah you know I'll get back to you in about six months you know yeah like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that kind of you know, it's, it's that show time versus reality because the thing about research and the thing about creative problem solving is that you can't say, I'm going to be creative for the next five minutes, right? It doesn't work yeah. like that. It's usually, uh, what I try and do is I think about, if I'm trying to solve a problem, I think about it intensely for like, you know, half a day or a day. And then I try and put it out of my mind. Like I go see a movie, I do something else. And my brain in the background is 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 working the problem. And then at 3 a.m., you'll bolt up in bed and you're, oh my God, I got it. Yeah. Right? You know, but it's, it's setting yourself up for your brain to do that work for you. You can't force mm. yourself. To do it all the time so that's that's the difference between that sort of you know sci-fi brilliance and real sort of creative problem solving do you take notes and stuff are you are you like a note taker are you looking through stuff or what do you how do you yeah, how I do would, you deal with all that stuff i mean like you know at, at the beginning of this podcast like uh, alex was saying oh yeah we might be doing a show where we look at the physics of you know like action movies or things like that oh cool and, and that's the a first brilliant thing idea. i did was like you see i got a little notepad right it's just mm -hmm. i scribble it down because so this is in my classes even though we live in a digital world i still make my students write with pencil and paper. And I don't do this just because I mean, I do it because there are educational studies that show the sheer value of forcing the person to take their time with the idea by writing it out mm, like that. Mm. And that's why I make my students, I don't make them write everything on the board because I hated when I was a student copying oh, down reams of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I do is I pick like the five or six really important points of the lecture and say, I'm going to give you all the slides in this lecture, but I'm taking out everything that's in red and mm -hmm. you have to write down everything that's in red. And that's my way. Oh, of that's just smart. Showing it faster, but it's, yeah, it's yeah, and it's yeah. they, they don't like it, but and I, I, and I don't even talk while they're doing it, like I, I just stand there for like a minute while they write so they don't miss anything that I'm saying. Huh. And so I think there is real value in scribbling things down and making little sketches. You know, it's why I have you know the little sketch on the whiteboard, right? I, to help me visualize. It's funny, you know, it's I was diagnosed with ADHD like uh, quite sort of late in life, and and one of the one of the tips I got was that you should write things down in a little notebook, and I was like so offended by that because i was like come on we're digital i mean it's got to be digital i got my phone with me I got my stuff. Nope. it's just i go to the phone to write my note and the next thing you know i'm on freaking tiktok and i'm like what was i supposed to do you know like it's like you, it just doesn't work you gotta remember where we came from you know we came from people making cave mm -hmm. paintings and telling stories around a fire yeah so there's value in little sketches and there's value in talking with other human beings i think you know this whole experiment <laughs> with online learning for me showed me that there's so much value to being in a room with another person and you know, sort of your brain works in a very different way when you're talking to a human being versus versus well, I'm picking up things, picking yeah. up things and pulling them apart, and like that that physical thing makes a huge difference in remembering stuff as well. Uh, next super chat, four ninety nine from Comics and Cosmetics. Hi, David. I'm Danny Comics and Cosmetics. Like, are you going to get like so like <laughs> like cosplay cosmetics or like? Sounds like it might be a cosplay. Thing, that's yeah. wicked. Uh, on he has a YouTube channel. We'll probably check it out. Uh, check drop it a out. link, uh, buddy, uh, in yeah, the yeah, chat room. It. Uh, just wanted to say hi. I'm a huge McKay fan and sci-fi fan. Thanks for doing this. Yes, thank you, David, for being here. And oh. Professor Target as well. Are you kidding? 
Like, you know, this is like, I'd be paying for this if I wasn't an actor. <laughs> this, this has been huge fun for me. And with, with David, if you ever need, if you ever want me on Tech Bandits, I'm there in a second. Oh, fantastic. So, yeah. That would be so well, much fun. Just, to... And we should do this again anyways. Like, let's just, we should just like, maybe we could pick a couple of specific movies or something and we can yeah. like, be more happy to. Yeah. Uh, these guys had me on for Don't Look Up and it was so much fun. Oh, yeah. And I just mm. love, I just love having these chats. So yeah, any, any other sci-fi films or anything like that would be great. To, to yeah. Do. Fantastic. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm planning on doing a series of breakdown videos. I've got uh, Charlie Allen from Combat international who films all the big battle scenes for like uh oh, cool. lee scott's movies and stuff yeah. and uh, i'm gonna be doing a breakdown videos with him on on battle scenes and movies and i was going to approach uh, a director james madigan i think you worked with him on c season two maybe possibly i don't know if he was yeah, on set with you or I not got, don't think i ever i might have but we, oh, we got to know. interview him on our channel and i'm going to reach out to him and see if we can do some like uh car chase breakdown scenes like how they film it and stuff like cool. that and, I, and uh, professor target i was like hey can we do like a science breakdown videos too so i'm trying to steal a little bit of that uh that um neil degrasse tyson stuff that he does I'm like i'm gonna mm. take that idea i'm gonna do it with professor target i think it'll be fun yep. No, that's well, great. Work with the resources you have it's like, and, I, and i was telling alex that you know when i was a grad student i used to do say consulting for you know, like police forces, because someone would say, oh, I had a car crash, you know, and it's, you know, I was only going 10 miles an hour. Well, you can analyze the wreck and figure out roughly how fast they were going, coming into ah. it. And you can see if they were all like, oh, I was blinded. I turned a corner and the sun was there. And it's like, well, not unless it was seven hours ago, the sun wasn't there. And so ah. you, can, you, you can do things like that. And that's, that's one of the. Oh man, you'd be fun. amazing at uh, OSINT. Yeah. yeah. The, the uh, what's, what is it? Open source intelligence gathering where they could take a photo and go like, oh, let's look at where the sun was. Let's look at mm -hmm. well, the, thing. I mean, like, the, the exact same uh, software that I use to study the size and shape of galaxies and the revolution of the time over time is the exact same software algorithms you'd use to analyze satellite imagery for airplanes, tanks, buildings, ships or anything like that. Right. It's the same. Cool. There's a lot of, you know, there's, 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 it's the same, the same tech just applied in different ways. Astrophysicist right. and secret agent. Yes. <laughs> there you go. He works yeah. for the CIA. It's confirmed. Yeah, it. uh, William Cortland for another $2 super chat. Unification of math um, map link provided in the chat. Well, thank you. So I'm pretty sure this guy is a super cool scientist and I want to chat with him more. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I love seeing your chats. It's it's interesting and it makes me feel very dumb, which is great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then like we got, too. Yeah, <laughs> we got another five dollars from Backyard Tardis. Backyard Tardis is chatty today. Uh, how realistic is it for Firefly? If you guys have watched that TV show, Nathan mm -hmm. Fillion, One uh, the for best. them to take for them to take donkeys to other planets. So this is something that uh, we've chatted about in our patrons only section. We review episodes of Firefly for this month. And uh, one of the biggest sticking points for our co-host, uh, Matt Vader, is that he doesn't think it's believable for them to be transporting livestock and animals to different planets to help terraform them. He's like, that doesn't make any friggin' sense. <laughs> okay, now I love the show, so I'm going to tell you the good and the bad that it does, right? So I love that, first of all, that it's silent. Like, whenever you, they never have any noises in space. It's mm. the silent. And I think that actually adds to it because it's an artistic choice that you hadn't, it's a physical choice, but it's an artistic choice you hadn't seen in mm. many other shows. That was a wonderful mm. thing they did. Uh, transporting these kind of animals like that would be fine, but one thing they've always ignored in that show is where does the gravity come from? Like what's right. keeping, transporting animals is fine if you have the setup they have, which is that you have A, artificial gravity, and B, are completely unaffected by inertia, by which I mean acceleration. Mm. So animals- Inertial dampeners. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So animals in space uh, would not do well if they were in microgravity, i.e. floating around the ship, or would not do well if while you're accelerating the ship, they're all squished up against the back. But since, if you just operate in the logic of the universe where there is artificial gravity and acceleration doesn't matter, no problem in transporting them mm. over relatively short distances. Here's one of my favorite stories about talking about uh, uh, inertial dampeners. So during the interview, you had Michael and Denise Akuda on Star Trek. We're talking about the transporters. And one of the things they need to make the transporters work is the uh, Heisenberg compensators to get around the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. And someone asked him, you know, how do the Heisenberg compensators work? And he said, oh, they work just fine, thank you. Because, <laughs> because if we knew how they worked, we could build one, but we don't. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm fine with transporting animals in Firefly if you just accept the logic of artificial gravity and okay. an absence of acceleration or inertia. Gotcha. Was, Real quick, was I, Matt's I, concerned that he didn't think that they were actual animals would be transported? I mean, like, could you have just brought the necessary... Well, I, know, I think because he grew up on a farm, so just the sheer size of having a herd of cows in a spaceship, I think, seemed right. a little bit more outlandish to him. He's like, and uh, we actually got to chat with Adam Baldwin, who plays Jane from that movie, oh, uh, yeah, from yeah. that TV show. And uh, he was like, well, they transported them when they were babies, and they just got them on the planet. Like, what, the, what else do you want? <laughs> yeah, shut up, uh, Matt. <laughs> yeah, shut up, bad Matt. Uh, but real quick, I need to make a correction because I, I made a mistake. Uh, Danny is actually a girl. I, I, I must have said... Um, 
the other wise uh, i apologize for that um but yeah oh. david is or danny is a girl from comics and cosmetics so uh thank you for being in the chat i apologize for for making that Thanks, mistake danny. um all right guys i think oh we got one more uh, yeah, yeah it's a super chat two dollars i'm a woman i'm a woman <laughs> damn you i'm a I, woman i apologize for that all right so we'll go check out comics and cosmetics for sure yes please absolutely guys uh let's see is this another one yeah right here Another two dollars super chat from William Cortland. Uh, I need Ronnie to sign a copy of my UFT. All right, well, sure, you get that sorted out. I'll sign. Yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, guys, that's all. For, oh my gosh, we're getting another one. There's another one from Backyard Tardis. We got to get going. I only got one minute left with uh, with David. Uh, Danny is great. I, I've she, got a. You've got a little bit of fuzziness. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. Uh, she is a cosmetologist, and on her YouTube channel, Cosmics and Cosmetics, she talks comics super in depth while putting makeup inspired by the characters. The characters. Oh, okay, great. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Cool. Okay. Yep. So uh, it's a little bit, yeah, a little bit of cosplay in there too. Thank you, uh, Backyard Tardis, for another. Some of my favorite things about word quickly. So I remember I was going to see an eclipse in Britain in 1999, and the newspaper stories, the, the newspaper headline was like astronomers, astrophysicists, and cosmetologists descend to watch the eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! That's, that's oh my amazing. god! It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, sorry, can I ask a quick question? I know I'm the one who's supposed to be wrapping it up, but. Uh, Tom, any suggestions for people who want to get into what you're doing? Like, what do you, what do you, what, what sort of, uh, for like a, a 10 to 16 year old kid who wants to get into this kind of stuff, what do you, what do you suggest? Good, good. So, like, I think it starts with what you're doing with tech bandits, right? It starts with being curious and wanting to know the answer. Like, pick something. This is what I said earlier. Start with something in your life. Pick something like Wi Fi and read about how it works mm. just for the sheer joy of it. And if that's interesting. Now, here's the thing with getting into science is that when I teach my introductory calculus based physics class, we start off doing the fundamentals. And I have to say to the class, look, look, you're here to learn science, to learn physics, mm -hmm. and physics starts, it's like, if you want to, imagine your passion is learning how to fix classic cars. Mm -hmm. You've got to start by learning how to use a wrench, right? Mm -hmm. Learning how to use a wrench is not fun, unfortunately, right? It's not what people, no one gets into to, to crafting to learn how to use a wrench. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, it does start with these fundamental tools. Like, you know, it starts with, with taking, you know, maybe, maybe taking AP calculus where you can. Not mm -hmm. because calculus is just fun for its own right, but but it becomes fun for the amazing things you can do with it in the future. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to take physics, you know, it just seems like oh, there's something rolling down a slope, or there's something spinning, and you're like, why am I doing this like that? You know, but it's it's the the what you unlock with that knowledge is beyond spectacular. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing: I'm not quite sure how to fix in that you know because I, obviously I see people every year coming through how to do physics, and something I hear over and over again is I had a great physics teacher. And that's why I'm here. And every year I hear that so much. So mm -hmm. I'd love to see so many more scientists getting into teaching and sharing mm -hmm. that passion, right? Because it's, I know when I was taking classes, if the professor was interested in the class, I, yeah. I made the effort. Makes all the difference. Makes I, I, all I, I, the I difference. Really and so much of physics, physics has the fewest number of people teaching it who have a degree in that subject. It's usually mm -hmm. taught by some poor math professor or biology professor who was the closest to it. So they make them do it. And mm -hmm. there's no joy. So start you know get interested in figuring out how things work like just just because that's the amazing part like when you can look at the world and understand it just a little more because you've you've, you've thought about you know like how a look at how an electromagnet works you know look at mm. how a piston works anything like that you know just these these amazing quirks of nature that we've been able to harness in these these fascinating ways you know how it's just it blows me away that we have a functional electricity grid like mm. don't take that for granted it is truly yeah. spectacular and then, yeah, there is going to be a bit of a time where it involves putting in the work and, you know, getting to grips with the mathematics. But that's that's learning how to use the toolkit so you can fix your classic cars. Mm. Like, don't, don't get dissuaded because it's not instantly fun. You know, like, it's amazing in the long game mm. like that. So, and first of all, even if, and just as you say, it's good advice. Like, when students go to college, they can take, they have to take a maths general education class. So they can do two things. They can choose to take calculus or they can choose to take trigonometry and statistics. And a lot of them choose trigonometry and statistics because it's easier. And I'm like, mm. don't do that. If you if you don't know what you want to be when you grow up, which some of the most interesting people just don't. Um, I'm still waiting. I'll yeah, figure that out at some point. Yeah. Like, <laughs> if, you, if you take the calculus option, you leave all these potential futures open. You can become an engineer. You can become a physicist, a chemist, a biologist. If you take the statistics option, you're narrowing your future choices because you now mm. you don't have the foundation. So just... Take things that are that you know that, that give you the option to branch into new stuff. You know, stay mm. curious, be interested, and it really is a wonderful thing when you can look. I remember when I was a 
cycling home from school, having learned about like force diagrams, you know, blocks and slopes. Yeah. And as I was cycling up a hill, I drew a diagram in my head with like the bicycle and I labeled the forces and things like that. And I thought this is either a mental breakdown or the beginning of my career. It turned out to be kind yeah. of both. But it was, just, <laughs> it, was just, it was just great, you know, to be able to know, oh, I see how this is. I see how the rotational motion of the pedals is transferred to the wheel, which makes it a linear motion and overcomes the, here's the friction, here's the forces, here's the things like that. Mm. It was just, now the world is not just, I don't want to live in a world which is just some sort of magic box where I poke buttons yeah. and things happen, right? Yeah. I, I care, I want to know why my telephone can ring when you dial it from around the world. I want to know why a picture mm. can appear on my computer screen. I want to know why that there is gravity in space, but people seem to be floating. I want to know mm. how we got to the moon, and we did, spoiler alert, and I want to know what the future of our species is. And when it comes to, you know, it, the world can often seem, you know, dark and depressing, and sometimes life seems like death by a thousand cuts. One of the reasons I love things like Tech Bandits is, and making, and the future, is that we can make the world better through a thousand small positive, yeah. positive yeah. acts. And here's one quick, I know we're running out of time, but here's a quick story in that we have a maker space on campus. Like it's a big room full of like 40 3D printers and carvers. Oh, wow. And it's, it's an amazing thing. And there's the things you think you'll do with it, but one of the best things we did, we were trying to address the issue of say homelessness in our area. Mm. And homelessness in our area looks like people living in their cars. So they have jobs and they're living in their cars. So what did we do? We built, the, here's two problems with living in your car. First of all, the breathing in and out introduces a lot of moisture into your car, which mm. causes the fabrics to start to rot and mold to grow. And you also need to be able to charge your cell phone to have a job. So we built, using the Makerspace, a solar powered uh, dehumidifier and phone ah. charger. Now that doesn't fix the problem of homelessness, right? That doesn't solve every problem at all, but it's one tiny act that makes life a little better mm. for a bunch of people in a simple way. And that mm. is the power and what I hope to be the future of science, making the human experience, making lives better through a tiny, through mm. hundreds of thousands of millions of tiny cumulative positive acts. Mm. That's that a good brilliant. one. I enjoyed Love that. it. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah, speaking we're going to get you on Tech Bandits. Yeah, yeah. speaking of Tech Bandits, uh, what's your, your topic for today, uh, David? You guys, you're going to be starting that in about an hour if I'm not. If... I, you know, I was actually, I was going to, but I don't think I'm going to today because I've got to, <gasps> I've got to do my, uh, my, my pre-op stuff. So I, oh, okay. I will probably not get to it today. But, okay. Um, but yeah, it's always, it's always pretty random. So it's, uh, it's, uh, you know. Catch you I'll, if you I'll can. Figure, I'll probably do it tomorrow. Okay. Do you have a, a topic in mind? Do you know what you're going to be talking about? Um, I don't know. What I normally do is I, I'm i like, there's a number of different sources that I love. Like the number of, like, I love BBC technology is fantastic for finding fun little stories. Um, and then I'll sort of dig a little deeper on some of those things. Um, but uh, but honestly, no, this week I don't, I, I have no idea. No idea. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's very exciting. It's like a... Um it's like a box of chocolates you never know what you're gonna get it really is and the other <laughs> thing is that you'd be surprised like you bring up stuff and you think like oh my god they're gonna love this and then mm. they're like yeah whatever um and so i find they drive a lot of the stuff i mean they i mean it depends it could be one kid it can be, it could be one it could be 10 who knows i mean it's like it's 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 all for me anyways that's great. <laughs> it's just me. i just enjoy doing it. well that's that's kind of what i do like everybody's like how, how'd you get you know because we've talked to a bunch of actors we've talked to you we've had directors mm. on and, and jonathan troppers the showrunner for c you're like how do you get all these i'm like i want to do it it's just for me like it's cool yeah. that other people like it too but i'm doing that's this because i'm a interested wonderful in side effect is that other people enjoy it that's great yeah, for me. yeah yeah uh professor target is there a way that people can uh, support you and your work is there something that you would like to shout out before we head out don't, don't find me, I'll find you. No, no. Um, okay. <laughs> so hopefully, I, I'd, I'd love to see people again. You know, if we do another collab, that I'm always happy to work with Salty Nerd. Love to work with David. Um, yeah. As I mentioned before, I'm going to be a science panelist at the Star Trek convention in Vegas. I give a talk called Myths of Astronomy, which is think you, things you think you believe about space from film and television versus the, the reality underneath them. I love that oh, kind of cool. stuff. I'm not huge on social media. Like, uh, I have a four year old, my life is pretty much focused. Pretty much focused there, so I, I'll I'll see people again on the Salty Nerd podcast, and hopefully on Tech Bandits. That's Excellent. great, yeah, yeah, please. Excellent. So we have one last question. My producer is, is trying to get out here. <laughs> it's like we need to get McKay and Zelenka on oh, the same yeah, podcast. Oh yeah, I can bug Nickel. Yeah, I'll bug okay. Nickel about it. Yeah, all for right, sure. cool. We can make oh, yeah, that happen, great. guys. Yeah, yeah, he'll be. He'll, that'll be a fun. That'll be a fun chat. 
Excellent. All right, everybody. Thank you guys so much for being here in the chat. Uh, I love seeing it. We got up to 50 viewers at one time. That was fantastic. Thank you all for the super chats. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I loved being able to put it together. Uh, it's been a long time in the works. Uh, we had to put pause on it because David uh, came down with the with the old Rona. and uh, <laughs> So we were like, all right, we're going to wait until he gets better before we do this. But uh, I'm so glad to be able to put this together. Uh, David, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. I love oh, working anytime, with you. Anytime. I love it's it. been love a blast. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Professor Target, thank you. Uh, I love having you as a yeah, contact. Yeah, Tom, thanks, man. Like that, my pleasure. That, this is this has so been a dream fun. for me. This I, has I, been I, great. I know it sounds silly, but really, you know, sci-fi is such a big thing for 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 many scientists that just uh, you know, I, I never imagined while I was slaving through you know PhDs and postdocs that I'd one day be sitting in my office <laughs> talking with David Hewlett. Like, <laughs> to me, that was that's spectacular. It's a grave disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's been great. Everybody, thank you guys so much for being here. If you're new, again, please hit that sub. We'd really appreciate the support. And I'm sure you'd love our, our content. Uh, we do a lot of really fun stuff with movies. And we, we get inebriated on Tuesdays and have fun talking about uh, random random movies and that we love wonderful. it's fun it's a lot of fun and david has actually joined us for uh robo uh, robocop i think robocops, you were on that. Did yeah. robocops yeah that was yeah. a great episode yeah. and uh, we also CS did for robocop yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we also have a in our patreon content we have a breakdown of doctor who with david as well oh, so if you guys yeah. are interested in that i wish i could have uh, done more of that that was the timing was bad for that i'm afraid but yeah. well we're we're doing it we couldn't we can cycle back around to doctor who for sure um you should do some of the old the old tom bakers yes <laughs> let's yeah. do it i'm in i'm in <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody, that's it for the broadcast today. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Stay salty, my friends. We'll see you next week.